G'day, battlers, and we are live for the first ever FSPN official Silverina Twitch channel. Nonsense, so much going on and so much hype to be had. And who, who's this handsome guy below me? Is that is that is that is that reigning world champion Speedius Chief hanging out? How's it going? <laughs> Hey, Steve. It's so good to see you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really excited for this broadcast. Like you said, this is a big deal. This is a huge deal to me. And I know it is to you. I'm just honored to be here uh, for the FSPN uh, Factions uh, broadcast today for the Silver Arena. It couldn't get more hype than this. Yeah, we today we're going to be taking a look at some of the best battlers in the entire world, duking it out, fighting for the glory in the factions format. So before we jump into it, Speedy, can you kind of give us a bit of an intro about what factions is, how it works, and what we can kind of expect to see today? Absolutely. So I was actually explaining this to a friend earlier today, believe it or not. So typically when you play Pokemon Go, you do have a lot of individual competitions. Uh, normally when you sign up for a tournament, uh, you're kind of playing as yourself. Maybe you're working your way through a bracket. Maybe it's in a particular league, Great League, Ultra League, or maybe even a condensed meta uh, like we're so accustomed to with the Sylph metas. Where the factions format differs is that this is a team competition, a team sport. And instead of just being in one league or one kind of mode, you're spread out across every single facet of Pokemon Go PvP. So it's an all-encompassing format. You get to uh, have certain players spotlight their abilities in certain metas, whether that's Open Great League, Ultra League, Master League, or one of the two more condensed, more traditional Sylph metas that we've seen throughout the past seasons of the Sylph Arena that have, that have made their way into factions as well. So you've got a Great League Specialist, an Ultra League Specialist, Master League, and then like I just mentioned, the four kind of condensed meta or field specialists as they're called. Uh, there are some interesting kind of uh, restrictions as well. For example, in the Masters and Ultra League, you can only have one legendary or mythical Pokemon on your team of six. Outside of that, there are very few restrictions besides duplicates, of course. So it really makes it interesting because you can only bring your, your Melmetal, you can only bring your Mewtwo, you can only bring Cresselia in Ultra League, or you can only bring the Giratina. As well, uh, one more facet I wanted to mention is that in Master League, it goes up to level 50. Steve, these are big, <laughs> strong, incredible Pokemon duking it out, and it just gets more hype in each league as you progress through a faction's belt. Absolutely. And that level 50 thing, very scary for someone like me, but that is kind of speaking to how good of a sort of format factions is that I don't have to do Master League. <laughs> like me and my poor little guy who only has one level 50 Pokemon and it's a Diggersby in Great League uh, <laughs> doesn't have to shell out all the resources because other people who are really strong in that format can come in, really shine in that Master League format and kind of play around in this like really, really just special little meta. Uh, so with all of that said, today we are going to be jumping in and taking a look at uh, the first official season has actually started with like one week in and so we're going to be taking a look at that week jumping into season one cycle one the north Amer north america diamond tier i think i said in north america there uh we're going to be taking a look at two of the teams in this uh eight team diamond tier the top of north america based on the preseason and that is going to be the chicago stars versus the canadian shield on now these two teams are really strong like really strong like i, I can't emphasize it enough a few little tidbits the chicago stars so we've done two preseason cycles so far. So it was this, we've essentially had 10 rounds uh, before this first week of the official season. And in that in that 10 rounds, the Chicago Stars went 9-1, going 5-0 in the last cycle. And uh, their one loss, I believe, was actually to Mazer. And I think uh, some, someone around here might have had something to do with that uh, one, one particular loss. Uh, very well may I think it actually was a, an 11-10 uh, win from Mazer there, which uh, I think someone in particular got one win that may have split the difference. Uh, but <laughs> also, uh, the Canadian Shield on similarly really strong team. I do believe they've also only lost once, but on top of that one loss, they also tied once in a 10-10 against another team. I think, uh, and I believe their only loss was to the, uh, I could be talking out of turn here, but I believe it was to the Marylanders PVP who went on to win the previous cycle in North America. So, Regardless, these are two incredibly, incredibly strong factions, and uh, they're here to duke it out. They are here to fight, and so let's jump straight into it with the first, uh, the first round that we're going to be seeing, the first about, and that is going to be in the Dungeon Field meta. So today, we're going to be taking a look at the Dungeon Field meta. There is also the Nightfall Cup meta, which is kind of like, it's a cup, but it's also in the field. It doesn't have the field name in the title. And then we're going to take a look at the Great League, the Ultra League, and the Master League Specialists. But uh, straight away, we've got Ifelici for the Chicago Stars and uh, OBQ Lil PDO from, uh, from the Canadian Shield on. 
How are we kind of feeling about these teams? Yeah, like you said, Steve, uh, so we're jumping right into these condensed metas. The dungeon format is a bit new, whereas the, uh, the, uh, uh, was it nightfall turn yeah. uh, format that you mentioned there is is one that we were actually more familiar with because we did play it in a previous season of sylph so to me this is a brand new meta that a lot of trainers aren't very familiar with you see some of the teams have some interesting components i mean if you look at some of these these pokemon you think well you know charm could really destroy these these mons here maybe a fire would be very effective but that's just the virtue of these condensed metas we don't see those real hard meta breakers in this format which makes these matchups very very interesting um i I really love Zwilus in this meta, to be honest, as well as a Scavalier. Whenever you're in a more condensed meta like this, you want to look at Pokemon that are flexible, that have stab on most of their attacks, and are able to kind of maybe have a potential shot at flipping some of these matchups. Uh, these Pokemon like Zwilus and a Scavalier have very few hard walls, but we do see some of them here as well from uh, OBQ's team as well. Uh, the Jellicent is very tough on a Scavalier. Uh, the Zwilus really does not want to see that Steel type Steelix with Dragon Tail after the Dragon Tail buff. Uh, but these teams are also remarkably similar, aren't they, Steve? I mean, we've got Jealous on both sides, a Scavalier, we've got Zwilus, we have Steelix, and Galvantula. <laughs> the only difference oh my here gosh. <laughs> is that the Mud Boys are different, right? We've got Quagsire versus Whiskash, and uh, I will, I'll let you pick your side here, Steve, but I prefer Whiskash just because it's faster, it's more consistent. Quagsire's energy schedule is just a little bit slow for me, but it does hit a lot harder. Yeah, personally, I'm actually a huge Whiskash fanboy, and I really just love the fact that you can kind of lead with it, maybe get some shields with some early blizzards, still have that mud bomb spamming potential. And that is actually kind of an interesting thing that they do both both essentially have identical teams here. And it actually might be a reason for people to perk their ears if they have to battle in the Dungeon Cup, because again, these are two of the best battlers that are in North America, so maybe they're onto something. Maybe there's a formula to follow uh, for this meta. But uh, again, there are going to be two Dungeon Field Specialists, so we'll have to see in the next round whether they are following similar similar paths but i guess uh the only thing left to do is to kind of jump into it and take a look at uh how this first battle goes uh in factions season one cycle one north america diamond tier shigaru stars first canadian shield on all of the words let's jump straight into it and we will be starting straight away Jumping in to the shiny Steelix from the Chicago Stars onto that Zwilus, which again, as you said before, really bad matchup for this Zwilus with the Dragon Tail buff. So seeing a double swap into a Whiskash first Jellicent spot. And uh, this definitely tends to favor one side. <laughs> It absolutely does. And Jellicent's a very interesting Pokemon in this meta. We commonly commonly see it cannibalizing other water types because of the lack of grass. Uh, you don't see a lot of real threats to the Mud Boys. I did see there as well, maybe a bit of mistiming on OBQ side, throwing that Mud Shot a little bit late, allowing the extra Hex through. Even if uh, Jellicent gets up even slightly in energy, this is even more favorable for the Big Jelly. Yeah, absolutely. But these mud bombs are just going to slowly be adding on here. You know, it, it's going to whittle the Jellicent's health down, which is definitely nice to see because it could potentially bring something in in the back to sort of uh, give it a bit more fun. But it's already up to this Ice Beam Shadow Ball combo. And it is actually kind of really interesting that it does have that Ice Beam Shadow Ball moveset. No Bubble Beam. So no real bait moves. You have to charge right up nukes only here. Uh, this mud bomb is definitely uh, actually going to let it come through. We'll be able to get this one charge move off. So it's now on to the, uh, onto the Canadian Shield on. Do they want to keep Switch? I think the question is here, do you know your counts? And he's going to push it here, oh shielding up gosh. the Whiskash. You've got to rely on these mud shots, Steve. Can he get there? Oh. What a calculation by OBQ. That's really strong there, really strong there. At this point, you cannot bring Steelix into this matchup. You have to bring in that Quag. Uh, Whiskash does. He's going for the Blizzard and gets the Blizzard before going down. But the question is, are they going to shield? Do they, they know the counts. They know that this could be a Blizzard. Oh my gosh, they're letting it go through. That hurts. That really oh hurts. Oh my gosh. Oh. But at the same time, massive no shield. What? At the same time, like maybe you want shields for later. You don't know what's in the back. Are there still two uh, a healthy Zwilus and a healthy Jellicent ready to go? You see, they're mad tapping on that Steelix, ready to go. They're waiting. Oh, going Ooh. straight for the Earthquake instead. I actually like this play when you throw blind. Some trainers like to throw the Stone Edge because it's a slightly less energy cost. No shielding the Earthquake. Zwilus takes a huge hit. In comes the Steelix. You know, Steve, this is still just a bit tough because we do see a Bubble and Bubble Beam Jellicent against the Steelix here. Yeah, definitely going to be doing a lot of damage to the Steelix, but it's a whether Steelix can get some crunches through as well. Crunch, definitely doing that big super effective damage. Not a huge move, but there are now, uh, it's a, there's a 2 to 0 shield advantage for I Felici over on the left. So uh, definitely is going to be able to kind of call some baits, potentially let that bubble beam go through, which is definitely nice, but still a little bit scary because the bubbles and bubble beams are going to be getting up. But I think Steelix is definitely going to get, be able to get to this crunch. 
CMP going for the Jellicent, that's okay. It's not the end of the world. Actually decided to shield up here to keep Steelix a little bit more healthy because again, that Zwilus is in the back and ideally you want to keep that shiny Steelix around to do some Dragon Tail damage there, even though you are a little bit debuffed. But this crunch is going to go through. Yeah, Steve, we've only been on this matchup for about 30 seconds, and look at how low the Steelix is. It's got lower health than the Jellicent, and it's just by virtue of those fast moves. Look at him reaching for the Quagsire Whoa. and the catch. <laughs> oh my god, what a good catch. Wow. Really nice catch there. Clearing all the debuffs on that Steelix as well, which is going to be so important for that Zwilus matchup in the back. Swapping in the Zwilus, so Quagsire is going to go down here. Zwilus is up to a body slam, so Steelix is going to be able to come in. It's like two Dragon Tails away. One Dragon Tail. They're not... Oh no! Oh no! They didn't get the you energy You missed off. out. Oh, no. That's really oh, rough. Oh, no. This is this is tough sledding here. I mean, trying to make the right plays. I really like the, the thinking behind the swap, but the Jellicent goes down. Steelix prevails. I love that move to swap, uh, Steve, because what you want to do is you know your Dragon Breath is resisted, so you need to hit back against that Steelix with energy. So I really love the mm -hmm. aggressive swap in, the farm down of the Quagsire. The, pl the plan was there. The plan was excellent. You force the shield, give Jellicent more of a chance, but just the Dragon Tails are just too OP there. Yeah, unfortunately, I only needed two. And you did see that they were tapping on that body slam at the end there, but unfortunately, they were just stuck in the move and they could not get it through. And by that time, it was just too late and that crunch was going to be coming through onto the Jellicent in the back. But uh, how do, actually, when you, when you adjust the score here, uh, sorry, ladies and gents, that is uh, going one up to the Chicago. Wait. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, left and right. Yeah professionals over here. Uh, but how do you kind of see, do you see them sort of changing their teams going to the next game? Because I feel like both of them sort of had ways to win there. So it's like, do they want to stick it out? Do they want to throw three completely different Pokemon in there to change it up? I, I personally kind of like their lines. Uh, I think they were both kind of decent. Obviously, it didn't go great for that uh, Zawilus being matched up against the Steelix in the lead. Uh, so maybe, maybe they want to bring, you know, they, there might be a bit of a lead hot potato going on in this next one. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely agree. So we got some uh, very important intelligence as well. Uh, we didn't reveal the ice beam on I Felici's side with the with the Jellicent, but we did learn that it, it is a hex Jellicent as opposed to the bubble Jellicent on the opposing side. So when you have the bubble Jellicent, you're dealing with resisted damage instead of uh, super effective, which makes the mirror a lot tougher. So does that affect how these trainers want to bring the Jellicent? Because as we saw, Jellicent could be a great safe swap in. Uh, that's that uh, attempt to bring down that Whiskash. It went a little rye there for our trainer there on the left side but it, it, we saw the intention it's a very powerful pokemon i feel like jellicent deserves a place in game two i just don't know which trainer will bring it and in what uh, conditions they're looking for but as well steve i will mention that the uh, against a double steel team the zwilus lee was a little bit curious to me do you want to see zwilus lead again that is a good point. See, I, th I do feel like Zwilus generally works a little bit, like it's a really good neutral matchup. It's a, it's a dragon. It's got that dragon breath. It can do so well in so many matchups. But you are right. There are those Pokemon that are running around that are really scary for it to really face up against. So it's kind of a case of, do you want to run as the safe swap? But, but if it's a safe swap and they've got a steal in the back, then it's really like big uh-ohs for you uh, when that kind of comes out. So maybe the Zwilus lead was like, okay, maybe we can get a neutral matchup. And if not, we can run away, ditch out of this steal matchup, which is what they did. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite enough at the end there but uh maybe maybe the lead is potentially a, a nice spot for it to be but we'll see what they do go with in this second battle now jumping straight into it and we have the jealous mirror oh man i think we all know that uh there's definitely some moves that are better to have here and some moves that are worse to have here water in particular definitely good to resisted they are both mad tapping on that shadow ball and the cmp is going to the right here canada taking it Absolutely. Whenever you see the uh, the female Jellicent, you just assume that the IVs are a little bit better, maybe a little bit more optimized. It's always risky to see if you are going to win CMP there. Uh, this actually dic dictates a lot uh, in this matchup going forward. You don't want to stay if you keep losing CMP, right, Steve? Yeah, the only way they can get out of here is potentially getting some sort of bait, but this the Jellicent that is losing CMP has got Ice Beam. They don't have the Bubble Beam bait, so they really aren't getting any benefit there from their moveset. So unfortunately, they're just really going to have to make a hard decision at some point. Do they want to let their Jellicent go down? Do they want to take some sort of shield advantage? Do they want to swap out? I'm, I'm not sure what the best play is here. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're actually seeing the Shadow Ball coming through on the right-hand side. That's an interesting wow, no move. shield. Wow. Well, I think content with taking shield advantage. Going to go ahead and let that go. And as we see here, the Hex Jellicent 
already dealing much less damage than the bubble jellicent did in the opposing uh matchup we saw in game one shadow ball coming through here no shield on steelix you'll love the steelix steve it can tank all kinds of punishment yeah, and uh, it is running that uh, same moveset. There's no Zwilith on the left-hand side, though. Able to get the crunches through now that there are no shields left on Ifelici's side. Uh, so that's definitely going to do a nice bit of damage. And no debuffs are through here because that Jellicent is not a debuffer at all. Uh, we can see that Steelix is pretty low on energy at this point. Escavli hiding in the back. Escavli just going, yes, I'm so glad I'm not in this Jellicent matchup. This has worked out <laughs> so perfectly for me. Uh, but yeah, Steelix going to be able to tank that Shadow Ball and will be able to... Oh, no, not going to be able to Dragon Tail down because we're seeing a Quagsire come out able to get the crunch off before going down that that was tight that was almost a repeat of Zwilith in the last game <laughs> a very very risky play i expect the swap out and we get it it's gonna be really hard to sack swap that one hp uh steelix but look at here he's got another move already going to bait with the stone edge i do like this play you want to be very efficient with your energy and successfully gets the shield which is huge uh steve escavalier just has had no place to go this entire match I mean, this is a this is definitely a nice little spot to like just unleash all of its energy. Quagsire going away, gone, and there is I think there is still that uh, jealousy with a tiny little. Oh, there's still a Steelix as well. Oh my gosh, this is Scavalier is just ready to party up. Uns 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 uns. One drill <laughs> run coming up, but and we're not going to see any catches because the switch time is not up for Ifelici, unfortunately. So just going to have to eat this drill run, and it is going to hurt. Yowcha! <laughs> oh dear. Well, wow. Steelix is taking a big hit there. We, we assume that we're going to try to see a catch here at some point. Oh, and it's a bit too soon. Oh, no. Countering down the ghost type Jellicent, and he succeeds. I think that's a nail in the coffin there, uh, Steve. Yeah, I think the catch went in the complete opposite way. I was kind of expecting to see a catch on the right-hand side, maybe trying to see uh, a scavily ditch out of there to catch Steelix's charge move. But no, we saw the catch, attempted catch from my Felicia, and unfortunately it just didn't work out in the end. It was, again, too early, didn't have the counts quite right, and that brings us up to 1-1 one, one in this uh, first battle, uh, first bout in, uh, in the matchup. And yeah, I, very, very impressive uh, plays there. I felt like the Jellicent mirror in the beginning was very, very interesting. Willing to give up switch advantage, but taking shield advantage in the process. I think shield advantage really helped to carry OBQ through the rest of that match. Uh, being able to protect against that that Quagsire's Stone Edge, Earthquake, etc. really set Escavalier up to sweep the Steelix and eventually win the match. Yeah, I truly feel like Escavalier is one of the best sweepers in this game. If you give that thing a shield advantage in the back, you are going to have a good time because as you said earlier, it is such a strong Pokemon. Uh, it's like it can really uh, have good play up against a lot of Pokemon, uh, ex except for that Jellicent, obviously, which it did happily avoid, happily avoid in this matchup, which was definitely nice to see. Uh, and a little bit uh, worrying as well, because you did see that, like, because they uh, decided to lose Switch at the start, they wanted to take that shield advantage, they very well could have found themselves in a spot where that Escavalier was going to line up onto Jellicent. But they were able to avoid it, able to duck around, able to outplay their opponent, and uh, take that victory to bring it up to a tied game. But uh, let's break that tied game Going into game three, we'll see if we see another different set of leads because I think that means we have seen uh, both players use two different leads now. Let's let's go for three. Let's do it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we oh go. Galvantula Mirror. I don't, I don't know about you, Steve, but I like to build one Galvantula with high attack and one with low attack just because if you're in a mirror situation like this, you want to win CMP. We see I Felici here throwing the lunge first. Yeah, I mean, I'm a I'm a high attack just noob. I just don't I don't need these high IV things. Just give me something that's got 15 attack and I'm ready to go. But letting the first lunge come through is I Felici going to uh, match it? They are going to match. It is going to be debuffed. It is really nice getting that first lunge through first. We're actually seeing the swap out into Whiskatch, which is a pretty interesting swap because you are bringing that hard counter out. But we're actually not seeing a swap uh, from I Felici's side, and it actually looks like they might not have a hard counter here. Yeah, this looks really tough, actually. I don't think I Felici was ready for this. And as we saw there, forced overtap, really nice play up by the Whiskash to throw when it did. You see the 10 turns versus 12, really uh, penalizing Felici here, going to throw the lunge. This will help the chip, but Steve, he doesn't have much that can outpace this Whiskash. No, this is really... And swapping into the Escavalier as well, not even the Quagsire. I mean, this counter is doing a lot of damage, but oh man, these mud bombs are come, going to come out hot and heavy. This is a really scary position to be in. Maybe there might be like some sort 
sort of catch. Oh no, there's not going to be a catch because it was a swap to a Scavalier. Garfinchel is still around. Oh no. Oh, oh, Speedy, st- stop it. it- <laughs> <laughs> this is Scavalier is pinned, kind of thrown out to the wolves here. Uh, the wh- the Whiskash wolves, if you will. I think you need to throw a move here as soon as you can to try to force a shield, and he finally does. But look at this uh, Scavalier, like you said, see, barely limping along. It's going to get this move off. And the shield from the Whiskash, oh the fish don't quit. <laughs> Not at all. And I mean, OBQ has got to be sitting there thinking, what have they got in the back? They swapped a Scavely into this matchup. What are they hanging out? Maybe this Whiskash must be important. So it does decide to protect it. Here comes that Quagsire coming in. There's a Galvantula. Galvantula is going to be going for that lunge, which it will be able to get off before Quag can get a move. Definitely going to just hurt Ifelisi even more in this matchup. It is, it's, it's rough. It's rough. <laughs> It is pretty rough. Going to take this lunge, and, and its neutral damage does so much because Galvantula's attack stat is so good. The Quag is loaded here, but I don't think there's... Well, I don't know. Maybe Ooh. we shouldn't count him out yet. Look at that back line there. Yeah, Quagsire does have a little bit of a play here. There is like definitely some stuff to be scared of. Whiskash is energy dry at this point, so a Stone Age is all they'd need. Swapping out, trying to catch... Oh, wait. Going for the charge move? No. No. Does eat up yeah, the energy, so- in this, in this situation, I think the Galvantula was going to fire the lunge. You need to throw the move here to negate that energy. This makes it really tough for Ifelisi. He's at 100 energy capped, and he still has nowhere to go. I think they're just... Are they going to try and go for a full uh, Whiskash farm down? Throw a bait Stone Edge at Steelix? Try and get an Earthquake through? Do something? It seems like that's what they're going for. Full farm down. Here comes Steelix. 100 energy throwing the Earthquake straight away. Do they call it? Do they call This is the biggest call of the game here. Here oh come. no, no. shield oh my gosh steelix is hurting but look at these dragon tails steve they're going to sneak up on this quagsire i don't think there's enough left in the tank here our our simple faced uh, quagsire friend he might get fast moved down here at this juncture yeah wow that is so unfortunate for quag able to land the huge earthquake through but just not huge enough taking it down and that means canadian shield on taking out the first uh the first bout round uh Bat- battle set uh take it out yeah. <laughs> whatever it may be called i bet that was just it was such a rough spot for chicago there like it just went from bad to bad to worse and it all really started off with that just line it was kind of it wasn't even an a b a line where the two a's are weak to whiskash and the middle one was uh yeah weak to whiskash and the middle one was good they just didn't really have anything that was a really good counter. I mean, we'll jump back into the into the teams now. And I guess they didn't really have like a great Whiskash counter on their entire line. Whiskash definitely able to run circles around. If they could land like a Jellison on there, it's definitely okay. But as we saw in the first game, not not exactly the, the biggest counter in the world. Yeah, I, I think as well, Steve, what we saw was a lot of Steelix and his Cavalier play from OBQ, and that really kind of scared away the Zwilas. And then we saw the Jellicent swap in against the Whiskash kind of go wrong earlier on in the series as well. So maybe the answers to Whiskash were just kind of just shrunk down and shrunk down and minimized and pushed out of the frame so that when the Whiskash safe swap finally came in game three, uh, Felici was just not in a position to try to counter it, uh, you know, in the opposing direction, just really nowhere to, uh, to maneuver there. Yeah, exactly right. It was a bit of a stuck in a corner, not having to do much at that point, uh, which is unfortunate, but sometimes that is how the game goes, especially with a game just as these high level mind games, you know, there was obviously plans in place that were like, I think that this is going to happen, then this, then this, I'll be able to do this. But unfortunately, just didn't work out this time. So with that, uh, Canadian Shield on heading into an early lead with 2 1. We'll jump into the second battle, the next dungeon, uh, dungeon field meta bout with Abhinav7998 versus This Is the Steve. Uh, no no secrets. Uh, so I might prefer one name over the other. Um, but. Uh, or, or maybe maybe I don't. Maybe there's only one true Steve. Uh, but this is going to be a very high tier battle. This is a uh, like Abinav is one of the best battles in the entire world. They've got that coveted Sylph Legend rank. Not many people are running around with that. And uh, there's a there's, there's a lot of uh, air of big strength going around. And up against this is the Steve who is a trainer rank in the Sylph arena, but that is not indicative of their performance because it just means they haven't been doing much in the way of Sylph arena uh, league battles where uh, I think the thing that really should have sort of shows their skill is the fact that they are in diamond tier of North America. They've gotten to the top uh, peak of this thing, which means they know what they're doing. They've got the skill ready to go and uh, have got some somewhat different teams, somewhat similar to the last lot. Uh, this 
this is the Steve definitely running a more similar team. Oh, he said that Jealous and the Galvantula, the Steelix and the Zawilus. But bringing in a little bit of uh, spice there with the Roserade and the Mudboy pick of Swamp at this time around. With Abanav again, somewhat similar, somewhat sort of spicy with that Jellicent, Zwilus, uh, Quagsite, Escavalier, four, and then running the Flygon and Berserker. Berserker is a, a very interesting pick. Uh, do we get to see Berserker? Are we, are we going to get to see it against this line? I was just going to mention, Steve, Berserker is very interesting to me. It's a steel type Pokemon with access to foul play, play rough, uh, close combat as well. And it has Shadow Claw for the fast move. So if you're looking for a, a Pokemon that resists Dragon Breath, uh, can hit back against uh, Dark and Steel with close combat, can actually hit back against Ghosts like Jellicent, which we see on almost every team with Shadow Claw foul play, I mean... Berserker kind of fills all these roles. I think it's very, very interesting. A lot of uh, Berserker players like to lead it, as you would with any Pokemon that has a debuffing attack. You want to get in there, fire your close combat, switch out, kind of play a duck, dip, dive, and dodge kind of uh, uh, strategy there. And I would really love to see some Berserker action. But Steve, the one thing that really stands out to me, and this was a big problem for Ifelisi in the first bout, not having grass coverage was very tough. And if you look at Rose Raid here, I mean... Roserade traditionally is a shield hog itself, but just picture Roserade against the rest of Abinov's team if the shields are down. You can leave Storm the Jellicent, uh, you can uh, Weather Ball the Berserker and the Scavalier, you can leave Storm the Quagsire too. I mean, it's extremely powerful. Poison Jab is a great move as well. I'd love to see some play from that Pokemon, and I think that that forces Abinov to bring some dragons to keep the Roserade in check. Yeah, I think you actually might be correct there. I mean, uh, we don't know for sure that it is running that Leaf uh, that leaf Storm. It is definitely, uh, I think, a moveset that will do it a lot of favors in this matchup with that uh, just spammy Fire Weather Ball able to act as that uh, that bait move. I, I do hope that that is the moveset. Um, it could, you could go either way with Poison Jab or a Bullet Seed in this matchup because, again, you kind of like that grass coverage is definitely really important. Not that Bullet Seed is the biggest grass coverage move uh, in the world. You're not doing much damage. Uh, it's no Razor Leaf, to say the least. Uh, but I... I do hope that we see Berserker play because I feel like Berserker is a Pokemon that a lot of people do struggle to use. Uh, I think, I, and as you become more and more skilled, as you reach these, you know, legend self status, you definitely become a lot more comfortable kind of being able to maneuver around any lines of three that you see, able to be a bit more dynamic. So if anyone's going to be able to use Berserker to great effect here, I think Avanav is a pretty good candidate to see. So I'm putting all the chips in. We're going to see Berserker coming in in the lead, here we go, jumping in to round, we'll call it round two, uh, seeing with Avanav up against, this is the Steve, game one starting right away. Round two, game one, right? Pazurka hey. in the lead. All right, I'll, I'll take that house, but we are not a, good, not a good spot for it to be, unfortunately. So we did see the instant swap into Flygon and Jellicent in the back. There is a, again, it's a bit of a moveset case here. That Jellicent on the right-hand side has Bubble Bubble Beam, right? It absolutely does. And like we mentioned before, Steve, that Ice Beam can be very effective against the Dragons, the Zwilus, the Flygons, any kind of other flying types you might see in this meta. But we don't see it here. We can see him going for the Bubble Beam as well. This isn't all bad news for Jellicent because this is a sub-ground type Pokemon. It is going to chunk slightly. And I think the most important thing, to be honest, Steve, is, sl is slowing down these Dragon Tails because they are wrecking the Jellicent. Yeah, that is definitely one of the uh, sort of biggest disadvantages to Dragon Tail as opposed to Dragon Breath is that you can get affected a lot more by these debuffing moves. Whoa, 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 hi, whoa. It I know, look at that. The Earth Power comes through. Jellicent on its last legs. He's going to shield at the Flygon. I love this play here by Avinov. He wants to get that Berserker away from the Swampert and he's going to do whatever it takes. We are now even shields, but Avinov takes control of Switch Advantage. Yeah, and not a... I mean, they have to bring the Swampert here, which means that, again, it's it's drawing that thing out so then Zwilus can maybe come back in later and take this thing down. Not that Zwilus is like an awesome Swampert counter either, but it doesn't take too much damage from the Swampert, so it can hopefully maybe invest a shield, going to let that Flygon go. We're not... Presumably not going to see Berserker come in here, right? Sh surely not. No, don't No, do I think we see the Zwilus here. Uh, it's going to be interesting once the Gavantula swaps in how he decides to handle it, though. I'm really interested to see that. We do see the Earthquake on the Swampert, and he's reaching for it here, Steve. He's not going to get there just yet. No, it does decide to invest the shield on this Body Slam, though, so making sure they are going to be able to get to that charge move. Maybe just kind of, oh, they're keeping the energy, swapping out. Now we're seeing this Galvantula straight into the Berserker matchup. Not a counter by any means, but unfortunately, that Galvantula is going to get its charge move off first. It's just a lunge, so it doesn't do heaps, but Berserker is such a squishy Pokemon. It still does a fair amount. Calling it, letting it come through, that is actually pretty nice there. 
Uh, gonna have to throw some charge moves at some point. There we go. There's the foul play. Not gonna take out Gavangela still, but it, it will do a bit. Yeah, I really like here that this is Steve is trying to gather energy where he can. He's gonna try to force some shields. And we see the vault switch is adding up. I don't know how I feel about the throw, but he's gonna take it down. But check this out. I think he's what he's trying to do is he's trying to put Galvantula in farm range for the Zwilus, eat it up with the dragon breaths, and then try to body slam the swapper. But he's still quite a ways away. Yeah, and there is still a shield on this Zwilus' side, so it's not the end of the world. They are going for the Hydro Cannon bait, maybe, because I don't think they were quiet at that earthquake. Uh, so maybe it does get the shield though, which is really nice for them there. And now just charging away. Yeah, this body slam is definitely going to be coming through. And this is going to be GG's good night for that Swamp Pet. And Chicago is going to be uh, back to tying it. It's back up to 2-2 two -two now. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of gone back and forth a little bit uh, both ways. Uh, yeah, it, it's kind of gone back and forth. That was a very sort of interesting, it kind of, kind of moved around a bit. That Jellison is definitely a very interesting Pokemon. And I think uh, obviously we aren't seeing seven rounds of uh, Dungeon Cup, but I think Jellison is probably striking me as a very strong Pokemon uh, in Dungeon. But how did you feel about that Berserker play in that battle? Yeah, I thought the Berserker was great. In li in the limited opportunities that Abhinav had to use a Berserker, I felt like he made the absolute most of it. As we recognize there as well, when the Jellicent swapped in, we've seen this twice, Steve, the safe swap Jellicent trying to maintain switch advantage, and it just fails. It's failed against the Whiskash. It's failed against the Flygon. I know that these trainers know their matchups. They know their shielding scenarios, and he was able to force that shield from the Flygon with the Bubble Beam bait at the tail end of that matchup, uh, no pun intended, because the Dragon Tails did so much work. Landing the Earth Power was so devastating. Jellicent unable to hang tight there. And I was interesting. I was interested as well to see how he played the Berserker versus Galvantula matchup. Because do you decide to bank the Body Slam on Zwilas and then catch the move on the Berserker, or do you try to swap instantly to it, gather some energy, and throw energy against Swampert? And we saw the latter happen there for Abinov as well. Just both of these trainers demonstrated their, demonstrating their matchup mastery. Abinov maybe one or two steps ahead of this is Steve. Yeah, and I mean, I think you are very, very right with that Jellicent matchup play. And it's a kind of a, something that comes down to move sets a little bit. Like if that Jellicent had the Ice Beam, it could definitely sort of maneuver a little bit better against that Flygon. It would have been a much better swap in. Uh, but unfortunately, it just, it kind of doesn't pack enough of a punch. And it happens to be landing up against his Pokemon that can land a pretty striking blow. Uh, can do a fair bit of damage. That, uh, uh, that Flygon able to just pack, like you saw how much damage that Earth Power did. That was absolutely just insane ridiculous and really really rough for that jellison and i guess you know they were you know they were praying hoping that it might have been a dragon claw bait uh but it just <laughs> didn't work out that way unfortunately and it it cost them in in the end uh so i'm kind of interested to see if they are gonna sort of swap their team up a little bit they might want to try and counter that a little bit i'm not sure if they had like a really great uh pokemon to i think they didn't have a great line of three up against abanav's line of three you could definitely go both ways though uh, so do you, do you think Abanav might be happy with their three? They might be happy to just kind of run with the hills. No. Okay. I know this works. Berserker, really strong Pokemon. This is all going to go perfectly fine. Let's go. Flygon is ready to take another Jellison out in the back. Or are we kind of thinking that they might play some more mind games going in? Yeah, well, we haven't mentioned this yet, Steve, but I think after game one, it's a real intelligence gathering mission. Regardless of whether or not you won the match, you learn about your opponent's uh, picks, what they thought would be strong against your team, maybe how they thought you would respond, uh, and maybe their tendencies as well. Uh, the tendencies to bait, the tendency to shield early, those things come into play. And as you kind of feel out your opponent throughout these rounds, just like a boxer, you try to find the weak points. Maybe uh, Abhinav is too committed to the Berserker. He's too wed to it. And then we see triple counter come in but if you overcompensate you can leave yourself open to even more vulnerabilities yeah I, I think that's definitely very true but there's only one way to find out and that is by hitting the magic button click and uh we are seeing that as well as first swamp it matchup in the lead which is a little bit different here now that there's just even fields uh you know there's no energy but that swamp is definitely going to be very scary with the potential of uh, some big nukes coming through they are going for the hydro cannon same as they did the last time but we saw the body slam going through perfectly timed from avanav just really nice counting there get that shield out of swamp it and now it is swamp it's time to maybe threaten a shield out of that swallows maybe maybe I was going to ask you, Steve, was that maybe a bit of a dirty CMP there? I, I'm pretty convinced that Swampert has a higher attack stat, but chat, let me know if I'm wrong. Uh, getting to the body slam, I thought it might be virtue of the Dragon Breath. Perhaps that was the case here. The one turn versus the two turn Mudshot. It's going to throw another body slam. This will be enough to KO 
Is he going to? No, no shield. Zwilus is easily going to take control here in the lead. Okay, now as well, it's coming in the back, which is kind of like, yeah, they're going to do super effective, super effective damage to each other. But this is while it's on this is Steve's side. It's going to take so much damage along the way. Like, this is a really scary spot to be in. Like, it's, that, that as well as on the other side pretty much had like a nice bit of health there. And we are now seeing the Berserker actually swap in, keeping their Berserker nice and healthy. And uh, this, actually going for the Dark Pulse instead of the Body Slam, which is going to get the shield to burning up a nice bit of damage energy. From uh from this is Steve. I'm kind of, oh and I was seeing another swap into Jealous. Oh no, Jellison. This is not the no, Jellison. <sighs> yeah, Jellison really kind of uh again being thrown to the wolves a bit <laughs> against Avinov's uh, Berserker. Homeless Cat is really coming at it here. Uh, the, <laughs> the foul play does so much damage, and this is a case too, Steve. Do you swap the jelly in earlier if you're going to sacrifice it just? to prevent the Berserker from getting a hit on energy. You see the Bubble Beam land, but that late swap into Jellicent means a Berserker can comfortably farm down here after the move, I think. Yeah, there is the... Oh, okay, they were counting perfectly again, getting that foul play off right as they were getting to the Bubble Beam. Such, such a strong battler. This is definitely going to take out that Jellicent. It's a really rough little position for it to be. Jellicent is getting no love in this stream so far, not able to find itself in a single good matchup. And this close combat is pretty much going to seal the deal uh. here. This is Wireless going down and Avanov taking out another battle here to bring Chicago into the lead now, three to two. Avanov, very, very impressive. It, it seems to be in total control. Sometimes, Steve, if you battle enough, and you probably have, have come to this realization as well, you can tell based on how your opponent uh, uh, plays the matchup, when they make the switches, how how timely they are on some of their, their throws, you can tell when they're, when they're uh, flustered. And I feel like this is Steve is kind of on his heels here going down 2-0 to Abinov. Yeah, I'm not even sure what you can do at that point because it's like, you know, again, this is Steve went in with a plan, but Abinov just was always five steps ahead of them. They're going super five ahead. So now do you try and go, okay, I when I'm in this position, when I'm up against a really good battle, they've crushed me in the first two battles. I try and go, all right, I'm just going to go hard, hard counter. They're going to go this, then this, then this, and I'm running it into oblivion. I'm <laughs> going to take these things out. I'm landing this darn Galvantula on that jealous and we're going to go to the moon. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see what uh, This Is Steve is going to do to adjust going into game three. Ooh, okay. Okay. All right. You're resisting the uh, dragon tails. The crunch is neutral, and you really only need to be scared of the earthquake. And look at the double dragons lurking in the back. <laughs> uh, Steve, as we jump into this matchup, I just have to ask you, where is Rose Raid? We haven't seen it a single time. Yeah, that's very true. Not just, I guess, not feeling confident enough that it could find a spot. It could obviously do a nice bit of damage here and there, but maybe Leaf Storm is just too much of a, a shield sink to be able to get to in these matchups. But we are now seeing the uh, debuffed Berserker hanging around, waiting to shield up this crunch from the Steelers. That is so unfortunate. Burning, uh, not, not burning enough energy for the shield, unfortunately. But we are seeing the catch onto Swamp at this close combat going through. This is, wait. Uh oh, this is gonna sting quite a bit, right? If not, I think that's true. Uh, but dang, that does so much damage to that Swampert. And Swampert was gonna be a really powerful Pokemon up against up against Abanov's team. Uh, as well as he's gonna come here and take down the Swampert, but they've got the fly. Oh wait, wait, wait a minute. There's an earthquake that might be coming through here. No shield. Think, no shield. Yeah, yeah, Steve. I think you let this go because you can bleed down this uh, this Swampert, but that Steelix is gonna come in, and we saw how much the Dragon Tails did. Look at it. Here it comes. He gets to the Dark Pulse though, which is actually a bit of icing on the cake here. Yeah, that is very true. It's just going to bring the Steelix down a little bit more. And then we've still got that Berserk hanging around. And I'm assuming I, I'm, we might see Flygon come in, but it's going to take a lot of damage from that Dragon Tail. Berserk has a little bit of energy. It looks like a Steelix is just ready, waiting. What am I going to come out and eat? Om nom nom nom. And it is going to be even that Berserker. Unfortunately, there is a bit of energy to contend with. Berserk is going to outpace the Steelix, but Steelix has that energy ready to go. And they're going for the Crunch Bait, which is actually still going to do a fair bit of damage because Berserker is, again, squishy and low, is going to get the shield. And now Steelix is prepared, ready to get to another charge move. They only have to burn the shield. Yeah, I feel like this might be a good opportunity to over farm by Abinov. You know, the Steelix just dumped his energy. It needs those five or six dragon tails to even get close to another crunch, but he doesn't. And that lack of energy might be might be really detrimental here. Going to push for the close combat, and he finally gets there. But Steve, this Swilus is going to shield, and I think it's loaded up. Yeah, it could be ready to go, ready to fire onto that uh, Flygon hanging in the back. Obviously, the dra it's going to be a match of Dragon Breath versus Dragon Tail, and there's going to be so much damage flying both ways. This wireless obviously having so much energy, ready to go. This Dark Pulse about to fly this Flygon, 
and there are no shields to protect it now. Bada bing, bada yowchie. But there's good, we can see a dragon claw. Oh, no, we're not. Oh, oh no. Wow, it's oh, wireless. Man. I, dragon the, Breath the wins. The closing power. Uh, dragon Breath wins out there. I think the closing power of Zwilus is really demonstrated there. Reaching that Dragon Claw C, but unable to get it. Such a close, almost 3-0 for Abhinav. And uh, we didn't mention this in the outs in the in the onset, but normally when you play your uh, your sets, you know you want that two one so you can advance in the tournament. You could advance in the in the whatever stage you might be in. But in still factions, because it's team based, every point counts. A 3-0. For this for this uh, matchup here, it might make a huge difference down the line. Abhinav only able to take the two wins. Yeah, I think a really important factor is a 3-0 is so much bigger than a 2-1. Because if you get a 2-1, you are going ahead and you've got one game up on your opponent. Happy days, 2-1. When you get a 3-0, you get a three battle advantage on your opponent. That is absolutely huge. If one person gets a 3-0 and two of your teammates lose a 2-1, you're still ahead because you got that 3-0. It is a. It can be a really game-changing thing, and being able to just like counteract and push past one of your uh, teammates' losses, because again, it is that team format is all about working together. It can definitely be a very scary thing. So, really nice job there from this is Steve, able to tie it. Up. Oh, tie it up. Well, yeah, tie it up uh, to three three yeah. in this format, and that means we are going to be now jumping into the next field specialist meta, which is the Nightfall Cup that we've seen before. We saw it back in last December. I remember being on your stream, Speedy, and talking about Nightfall Cup way back when. And uh, lo long times ago, lots of uh, no shadow victory bells here, though. We are going to see uh, some, some pretty pretty similar teams, some things you'd expect. We're seeing Burnabus, again, a legend, really strong player, one of the best in the world, running that Venusaur, Swampert, Frostlass, Galarian, Sunfisk, Alola, Ninetales, Shadow Glade, up against Freezing Suns, Frostlass, Galarian, Sunfisk, Venusaur, Scrafty, Alola, Ninetales, and Swampert. Seeing some similarities, but also some differences. So what are you, what are you kind of seeing here, Speedy? Yeah, I think the first thing that stands out to me, Steve, uh, we are switching metas, but you can just tell based on the team compositions here that Gallade is one of the most powerful Pokemon in the Nightfall Cup. It's going to be very tough here, I think, to overcome uh, the lack of Gallade by Freezing Sun. I, I just feel like it's one of those Pokemon that needs to come on your team. It is a high skill Pokemon. You really need to know those matchups intimately because Gallade does melt to any kind of neutral damage especially the shadow variant it cannot hang in these matchups very long but man when you swap that galade in it can flip switch against almost anything here on freezing sun's team the neutral confusions the leaf blades the close combats it's it's just really really uh, a dynamic pokemon but it's very very high skill because you need to know those matchups one wrong shield one miss fast move or one miss time confusion can really foil your entire plan I'm in such strong agreement. Gallade is such a powerful Pokemon here. Just look at all of the Pokemon that Freezing Sun has got there. Swamp it, not a great spot to be in. Scrafty doesn't like close combat. Venusaur doesn't like confusions. Galarian Sunfix doesn't like close combat. Frost has an all nine Ninetales also still taking a big chunk of damage from Gallade. And not uh we it actually may be a uh, charm all the Ninetales because it uh we do have another ice user with that frost lass. Again, these are sort of the games you play in teams of six. Uh but so charm Ninetales is probably the best counter they've got. And I think that might mean that Freezing Sun might feel compelled to bring that nine tails into potentially every game to counteract that uh, burner bus glade again these are two incredibly strong battles we've got burner bus with that legend ranking and freezing sun with that elite ranking these are going to be very powerful and there's going to be i think if glade is going to be around and potentially two frostlesses on both sides there may be some uh, quick swaps going on uh quick warning we are going to be only seeing one uh, one perspective on these battles, we are only going to be seeing Burnabus' side, but let's jump into it. Jump into the battles here and go into round one, focusing in on the left here, and not a good start for Burnabus at all. Oh, no. You see the Venusaur swap answered with Stunfisk, a bit of an interesting play. Uh, this matchup can go either way. You want it to land the Earthquake if you can. A lot of it comes down to those two turn moves. If you can sneak in a Mud Shot, sneak in a Vine Whip, it can really compile as the matchup goes on. And then the longer you stay in, it's always important to remember, Steve, 665 for Frenzy, 665. 665. I'm learning as we're watching. Um, <laughs> do we see the shield come in from this Venusaur? We do, and it is unfortunately the rock side, not calling the earthquake on that one, which definitely puts Burnabus in a little bit of a disadvantage spot just because they are down a shield now. Going for these frenzy plants though, really trying to get that shield out of Canada. But we have seen before that Canada has decided to let their Pokemon go down for that uh, shield advantage, but not this time around. They want to get their energy off. They want to beat this Venusaur down. But does Burnabus really want to invest? Ooh. 
Big, big earthquake coming through here. That Venusaur is suddenly very weak. I think if the Stunfish shields, it might even be able to mud shot down, which is just a huge insult for a grass type. <laughs> That is a, definitely a scare. And they are shielding. I think you're right. They're going to be able to mud shot all the way down and have tons of energy ready to throw anything onto a potentially, if it's Glade, that thing is going to hurt. If the Swamp it, that is also going to hurt. This is not a great spot to be in at all for Burner Bus. Does still have that shield though. So we'll be able to burn a shield onto a potential Earthquake that comes in there. Deciding to bring the Swamp it in. I mean, do they, do they call it as an Earthquake or they think it's a Rock Slide no, bait coming through? I think you let it... You let it through, Steve, no matter what. You have to try to sweep with Gallade at this point. As we pointed out, it's your most flexible Pokemon. Swampert is useless against Venusaur. No no reason to shield. Here comes a Gallade. In comes the Ninetales, and it's Powder Snow, oh my Steve. Gosh. This is huge. This is so huge. This is going to do so much worse up against this Gallade. Look how much damage the Confusions are doing. Still holding onto this shield. Down to below half health into the yellow. And the Ninetales is getting its first shield off. This, this Gallade only has to get one Leaf Blade through. And then Confusions will be able to take care of the rest, I'm pretty sure. Does get an extra Powder Snow in there. But this is a very scary spot for Freezing Sun to be in. Man, that is such an unfortunate spot with that Powder Snow Ninetales. Oh, yeah, wow. I see a glimpse of hope, but look at this Venusaur. It's not done yet. It's going to get to the Frenzy Plant here, throwing the close combat. This is resisted damage, Steve. I think ideally the Venusaur dumps its energy. You outpace with Swampert, but this, this is going to be a crazy finish here. Oh, my gosh. Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. Oh. <laughs> resisted. Res resisted. Uh, Shadow Glade. It's got some got some, uh, got some, some thwift in it, and Swampert oh. able to mud shot down a Venusaur. That is disgust. Oh my gosh. That was a. Cr oh my God. Uh, That's. Wow. Mudshot is apparently a very OP move. Uh, such a high damage move. We've seen it take down two Pokemon in this one single game. Just incredible. I've seen. I've seen Burnabus in the chat. Burnabus, why did you swap out of Swampert versus Venusaur? It's obvious that Swampert hard counters it. Why would you switch? <laughs> what, are you, what are you scared of, man? Just Mudshot Venusaur yeah. all the way down from full health. He's easily done. But we. <laughs> <laughs> we'll jump into game two. I'm. Let's, oh dear, there is it. more antics to. Here we go again. All right, what? now that Burnabus knows that it's a good counter, we're expecting him to stack. Whoa, whoa, what? This um, looks oddly familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that I put the correct battles in here, and we aren't seeing a complete repeat. But uh, we're, only time will tell. Or Burnabus can tell us in the chat that hey, this is this isn't what happened. Uh, but we're going to see this frenzy plan. <laughs> Go through. We'll just see if Stunfist can land that Earthquake again. And if they want to play it a little bit differently, because even though they did land the Earthquake through, they were able to mudshot down that Venusaur. It didn't actually end up working out for them in the end. So if they're running those same lineups, will they want to do something differently? And getting the Earthquake shielded, that is really unfortunate for Freezing Sun here. That definitely pushes it further away from potentially a nice spot or forces them to not make the same decisions that could potentially work out for them. So we'll just have to wait and see how they do decide to play the rest of this out. I couldn't agree more. Stunfish shielding up there, still searching for the Earthquake, and somehow the Mud Shots have already pushed this Venusaur down to about maybe, what, uh, four-fifths health. Uh, let's see what happens here. Earthquake coming through Ooh. again. Stunfish is relentless here, putting tons of pressure on the Venusaur. I think you get the shield here again, Steve, but I think that we see another Mud Shot down, just like we saw in Game 1. Yeah, I definitely think... Oh, no, we're going to play it no! differently. We're going for the win this time. We're going to we're gonna play some different strats going through there, try and get through Burn Bus's shields. So something else is going to get a tiny little bit of farm and it is deciding to be the Mirror Venusaur. So Ooh. this is actually a really interesting spot because if Swampert's not coming out, Glade is presumably going to be the one to come out. And now that Venusaur has a bit of energy advantage, it can really threaten with these charge moves. Glade, we saw how much damage it could do with a close combat, but it is a really squishy Pokemon in return, especially with that Shadow bonus. So it has to shield up that first Frenzy Plant. And now we're seeing the swap into Scrafty versus Swampert. Okay, this is a very rough spot. This is nice for Burnabus because they're keeping their Swampert away from the Venusaur, but this could yeah. this kind of go either way a little bit. Yeah, I'm a bit confused by the swap, to be honest. I think you want to keep applying pressure there. Uh, oh, lands the foul play as well. I mean, no shields in play, so why not go for the foul play? Maybe this is the right move, actually. Burnabus still fighting, though, going to try to draw a shield here with the Hydro Cannon. Uh, we'll see what this Scrafty decides to do. Do you feed... I think you, uh, you know what, Steve? You could even feed the Venusaur and then Frenzy Plant the Gallade. I think that might be the play here. I think that's definitely correct. That sounds like a really nice move. Again, going for that Venusaur uh, shield advantage, uh, energy advantage and just has the shield as well. So Gallade has no choice but basically to try and Confusion down, but it's going to be hit by a Frenzy Plant. It is just going to. No no ifs or buts about it. Uh, we're going to see Burnabus go up for the double Leaf Blade because there's no other, nothing else for them to do, but this Frenzy Plant going to come through and... Uh, 
That's all she wrote for <laughs> mic, mic drop on the Glade Bernabas Falls in game two of this bout. Yeah, I mean, just I love the patience by Freezing Sun. That's another thing as well, Steve. We saw in game one of Bernabas really at a unfavorable position from the offset, and it kind of slipped through Freezing Sun's fingers, unable to capitalize. We see in game two, he says, you know what? I'm bringing the Venusaur again. I dare you to lead the Glade because I know you won't. And then he actually wins the lead again and is just more, uh, more relaxed with the approach, letting the scrafty go going for energy advantage i really love the plays plays there by freezing sun that's a good way to bounce back yeah truly uh both battlers are really skilled but freezing sun able to kind of flip the tails there so it's a it's an interesting case where we're now in the 4-4 tie again the, these guys are just kind of following up with each other again this is a very very top tier battle so we'll jump into battle numero three see who decides to go into the next lead as they battle battle to Jenga. I'm, I'm trying to think of some game that you tear up together yeah. next to each other, but that's Jenga is the complete opposite. You, you don't, not Jenga, opposite Jenga. A, and Jenga, Jenga. In, Jenga in reverse. Jenga so in Australia. Like, you know, uh, <laughs> Australian Jenga. Exactly right. Number three, jumping in, and we are seeing a flip to Venusaur versus Swampert on the other side. Burnabus has had enough of these Swampert leads <laughs> and switching it completely. This time, though, Stunfist still coming into this matchup. But Venusaur now has a little bit of an energy advantage, so potentially may not be as uh, as scary a spot for Burnabus this time around. This is a bit of a precarious situation. We saw the Stunfist takeaway switch from the Venusaur uh, almost twice there, choosing not to shield in game two, but actually double shielding and taking it in game one. This is tricky because uh, you still have the Gallade to deal with the Swamper, but you have to be very careful about how you handle this matchup. Earthquake coming through early is really tough, though. This Venusaur, man, I hate to say it, Steve, but this grass type is almost in mudshot range. <laughs> no, not again. We, we, we can't keep getting away with this. <laughs> okay, we, we're, we're not Okay, let's. Although there is still a Swampert with Mudshot hanging out in the back. It very well could come out here and just Mudshot down, get that energy ready to go. And uh, no, not, not this time. We're seeing that Venusaur come in. And Gallade is in such a powerful position now. There is a Venusaur and a Swampert in the back. This Gallade could potentially just burn both shields, take this Venusaur right down, and then just throw bulk energy, bulk, bulk Leaf Blades at the Swampert in the back. I, I, feel, I feel like there's just nothing. that. Okay, Swampert coming in a little bit early now. Still has the shields I do ready like to this go. Play. Yeah, it has the shields to protect itself. It maybe can outpace. The longer you stay in that matchup, the worse it gets. Because I think six confusions from Shadow Gallade definitely KO the Venusaur, and you're just at a huge disadvantage. But recognizing that, Freezing Sun is trying to make the adjustment here. It throws another Leaf Blade, and the pressure does not stop on the Swampert. This is such a scary spot for it to be in. Deciding to burn the shield on that Swampert to try and get a charge move off, take that last shield out of Burnabus, and here it comes. I'm sure they do have a process in the back, so potentially they might actually let Gallade go down here. And that is what they're doing. They're going to let it go down, bring in Frostlass potentially, or Venusaur to take it down. Either way, they could they could get a little bit of farm on Frostlass. They could decide to just take it down and then bring Frostlass in once a Swamp it's taken care of. They are going to take care of it. Actually, eat up the energy. So going to let it go yes. down. Frostlass, I think, will be able to powder snow down. May Is, is Frostlass going to have to burn a shield? I'm not sure how much I energy. I think Frostlass... It, it might. The, the equation that Burnabus is running is, does the Hydro Cannon do more than the Frenzy Plant? Which move can I survive better? And how can I uh, set myself up here for these, these final moments? Choosing to shield the cannon, understood. I think you could go either way. In comes the Venusaur, and look here. Yeah. Avalanche. Snow is falling. <laughs> <laughs> By oh, Venusaur. I mean, it was such a dominating spot for Burnabus already. That Gallade was just in an incredible position. Like, it could not have been better for it. And unfortunately, Freezing Sun just, they tried to maneuver out of it. But in the end, Burnabus taking away that 5-4. Yeah, this is one of the... Oops. <laughs> No worries. That's one of the hardest kind of positions to be in. When you're late game, we saw Burnabas take those extra few seconds on his switch clock because he was trying to remember how much energy the Venusaur had, what the pacing was for the Swampert. Was it four mud shots away or five or less? Uh, how could he kind of pencil out the, the remaining seconds of the game to to line up a victory? And sometimes, Steve, those 10 seconds feel like they last 10 seconds, and sometimes you can really make the most of them. I thought Burnabas did the latter there in game three. Yeah, exactly right. Just really strong throughout. And we we saw three Venusaur vs. Swampert leads in a row as well. Uh, and on both sides and also going all sorts of different ways. Burnabus uh, losing the first one, winning the second, and then flipping the lead to win the last and push the Chicago Stars into the lead going into the fourth and 
fourth and second nightfall uh, nightfall battle with uh, Keenvart up against Tangent four four four. I think I think Tangent and Freezing Sun are actually number two and number three in Canada uh, overall. So again, really strong battlers here. But uh, we're seeing some some similar teams and some differences. Keenvart running six Pokemon that we have. I, I feel like. Are we getting deja vu here? A uh, Shadow Glade ready to ready to come again, but this time Tangent is responding with a Glade of their own. No Shadow though. Yeah, definitely see the Glade down there. The non-Shadow means you pack a little bit more bulk. Some of the matchups do change because you do hit different uh, bulk and break points in terms of the fast moves. So maybe uh, the Shadow Glade can't survive a certain number of Vine Whips. Maybe it can't survive a certain number of Powder Snows. These are all calculations that these trainers make uh, through their practice. They recognize the matchups through the Sims on PV Poke. They take a look at these things. How do you want to play your Glade? If it, is it more of like a lead Pokemon that you're going to try to uh, kind of burn shields with? Is it your safe switch? which you can tell a lot by a trainer's strategy based on their shadow designations, which is really interesting as we also see the shadow Lapras here on tangent side. Lapras Steve is one of the OG Pokemon. It's It's got stab on its ice moves, stab on the water moves. It's such a versatile mon, bulky. I mean, what more can you ask for? Well, you can ask for a bit of Shadow Sprinkled on top, uh, and Tangent has decided to opt for that. Just paying off a little bit of the bulk for a bit more attack in those just sp spammy, spammy surfs. And we're actually not only seeing the Shadow flip on the Gallade, but we're also seeing it flip on the Venusaur. Tangent decided to run the Shadow Venusaur up against Keenbart's regular Venusaur, which could also be an interesting little matchup. The Frenzy Plant's even more deadly if one is able to land on that Shadow Gallade. Shadow v Shadow, there's so much damage going there. But at the same time, you know, again, it's that payoff. You're always going to be taking more damage from the confusions coming through so it really could go either way here and we are seeing another two fresh alola nine tails there could be powder snows there could be charm i was completely completely wrong about the moveset in the last one and uh to, the, to their detriment they really should have taken my advice to be honest i uh, really would have worked it a lot better for them uh, but uh, <sighs> yeah we kind of are we, are we make any predictions on a long nine tail moveset to this page or are we past that it, it's too hard to make no, no, I, I definitely think you make a great point. I think that the charm nine tails against that Gallade, especially as we saw in game one uh, for Burnabus there would have been really devastating. But unfortunately, it was the powder snow nine tails giving the Gallade the time to get to the leaf blade to KO and then line up the close combat on the Venusaur. But the one thing we haven't mentioned yet, Steve, is that during the factions bouts, once the teams uh, go live and you can see your opponent's teams, you can still t TM the moves, correct? Before you face your opponent. Yeah, that's exactly right. Factions is sort of unique in that sense that you are allowed to TM after the teams have been revealed. So Keenbart, especially, I feel like is going to be looking at that and go, do I want to go for Powder Snow or do I want to go for Charm? Well, they have a Metacham and Charm would be a really nice thing to have up against that Metacham. Really hard counter there. So I, I feel like Keenbart is almost certainly going to be run that Charm again, but also because they already have that ice coverage from that Frost that's able to get that Powder Snow's Avalanches off real quick. On tangent side, though, you could potentially go either way. We could see the charm uh, where Burnabus might have wanted to have that in the last one, or we could potentially see that Powder Snow still. Both going to be very strong. Tangent does not have the Frostlass for the ice coverage. They do have the Lapras, so it is going to be running a little bit differently. It doesn't have as much ice oomph that uh, Alolan Ninetales could cover with that Powder Snow because it is, you know, it is presumably running an ice fast move, but it will have Surf as the char as the spammy charge move. He might not have Ice Beam as the charge move anyway. He might have Surf Skullbatch, which is uh, arguably one of the most, or arguably the most common moveset on a Lapras. And it does give you a lot of ice. So maybe there, maybe it's all, all a game. It's all mind games here, <laughs> here at the top of the hour. Uh, but I, th I think we'll just have to jump into it and take a look in this fourth battle at five to four to the Chicago Stars. Can Tangent fight back? to bring the Canadian Shield on to the lead. And we are going to see the Sunfisk going into Gallade. Oof. All right, so this is a bit interesting. We look at the back lines here. Stunfisk does have generally neutral to favorable matchups against both the Mirror and the Lapras, depending on shielding, of course. We see the close combat early here from the Gallade and the early call by Keenbart. Man, that was scary. And we're only a few seconds into this match. <laughs> but Keenbart keeping it cool. Real nice shield at the start and going straight for the Earthquake and it's going through. This is such a rough spot for Tangent straight away. I've got the big nuke uh, shielded. And let the big nuke come through. That is rough. And now bring the Stunfisk mirror in. 
And Keenvart not only was able to take the laid out, but has the energy advantage. Tangent is sitting there going, oh no, what's going on here? This is not good at all. Is able to correctly shield the Earthquake, which is definitely nice. It's good recovery, but we'll have to wait and see if Tangent decides to just take shields or if they are going to go for some sort of bait factor with the Rock Slides. These just, oh my gosh. Tangent did, counted it so you, nicely. So did nice. Did you see there, Steve? I I think he forced CMP on purpose to try to determine who would win CMP. That bit of knowledge is very important. Now you know if you can have time to overcharge or not. And he learned there that he does lose CMP. Letting the Earthquake through. Stunfist goes down. Keenbart finally losing him on there. In comes the Venusaur there. And you know what? After these mud shots uh, and vine whips <laughs> add up, Frenzy Plant's going to be really dangerous. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just so many flashbacks to mud shutting down Venusaurs. This is just such a scary spot. We are seeing King, but again, correctly shielding up the big nuke moves, shielding up that Earthquake and getting a ton of energy on that Venusaur. Unfortunately, not able to time their move to not allow that mud shot to come through. Still, it was going to be coming through there. Frenzy Plant going to head off. But a Bing Butter going to come through there and could potentially Vine Whip down there. Uh, oh, no, there's no more shields. So this Earthquake this is, is going to really... take it out. But... Yeah, this is really tough, Steve, because you see the Lapras there in the back. Generally speaking, Lapras's Ice Shards can do a lot of damage, but oh. you don't want that Venusaur up energy. Here comes the Frenzy Plant. This is super effective. Lapras is going to get blasted here. That's so rough for Tangent. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I, did did Tangent just, just lose on the on eating a Frenzy Plant into Lapras instead of... Oh, man, I mean, maybe they were going to go for a full uh, Vine Whip down, but... A whole Pokemon Still. just appeared and then it was gone within seconds. And then, <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah, that Lapras really didn't stand a chance. Famously, because Lapras does get stab on its ice shard attacks. If you're in a shielding scenario against a Meganium, a Venusaur, any kind of grass, over time, by virtue of the ice shard and Surf, you can overpower most of those mons depending on on even shields or even shield advantage. But when the shields are down, Steve. Lapras totally exposed against a Venusaur with energy advantage. Man, that is tough sledding. As we saw there, Lapras barely even able to hang on after one Frenzy. One more Vine Whip uh, did the trick there. Yeah, there is some interesting, uh, as you kind of mentioned, getting out information about CMP is not only useful for that one matchup, but there are still two battles to go. So that's really helpful if they may find themselves, like if Tangent found that they had CMP, they may be more likely to bring uh, Stunfisk in as a lead where they might not know that they would be able to win that one out. And also kind of interesting, by letting the Lapras go down, they've kept all of their moves hidden. No, no idea what that Lapras is running. So, you know, you can guess that it's going to be running Surf, but who, who knows what's running on the back there. Tangent and Keep can get all his secrets to himself. I'm not, I'm not, I'm I have to wait and see how he decides to kind of use that information going into game two. I feel like we are unlikely to see a Stunfisk lead now that he knows that he does lose CMP. Not that it's like the greatest lead in the world, but it would have been a nice little cherry on top to make it a much better sort of play there. But let's jump into game two. Take it away, Speedy. Absolutely. We see the Glade into the Lapras here. You know, those Leaf Blades are going to be really tough. A Lapras needs the 12 turns for the Surf. Uh, same as the Glade here, correct? You need four Ice Shards versus three Confusions. They get there. It looks like Glade is going to get there maybe slightly first. Maybe a bit of desync on the opening matchup there. Throwing the Leaf Blade. Lapras has to respect it. Let's look in our bank here, Steve, and see how he can answer the Glade. He does have that Nine Tails lurking there. Does he continue to leave Lapras in this matchup? Yeah, I mean, it is nice to have, but it's also a little bit rough. You can still get some shields out because you've got that shadow bonus surf. You've got the shadow defense dropped, uh, Gallade. He's going to be able to force a shield there, but it looks like Tangent is just going to use Lapras as, oh no, going to burn the shield here. I'm just going to say, it seems like Tangent is kind of using Lapras as just a soaker of all damage and everything else uh, from that last battle. But oh my gosh, oh my gosh, able to get the surf off going to either press that last shield or take the down and it's going to take the down tangent able to take switch advantage but at the cost of shield advantage and this Venusaur is now going to have some energy ready to go onto whatever it does come in we don't know nine toes move set yet look here steve we talked about the shadow glade versus the regular this shadow glade is mean it comes in the lead <laughs> it strips shields uh keen bart goes up shields and then he unleashes his venusaur we saw this in in the last game we're seeing it again that frenzy plant smacks that nine tails and it is a charm tails as well oh charm tails no that's actually really interesting that they didn't go for the sludge bomb but i guess they're still able to bring this uh bring this stunfisk in catch the ice weather ball such a just such an amazing it's such catch. A 
<laughs> we, we just need a moment of silence, right, for this uh, this catch that was so beautiful. But in comes the Metacham. This is interesting here to me, Steve, because the Venusaur did leave with energy. However, Psychic, Ice Punch, both very powerful moves against the Grass Poison. Throwing in this Metacham might have opened a window here for Tangent. Yeah, very possible. This Earthquake is not going to do a whole lot to that Metacham. I would take it down to half health, but this Metacham will be able to counter all the way down. I, I don't, yeah, and Rockside's not going to come through there. Not going to come through there. Metacham able to get the farm, mm. but CMP going to the Metacham. Keenvart has to fork up the shield. Just has to. It's, <laughs> it's mandatory. <laughs> Uh, next level play here by Keen Bart to leave with the Frenzy Plant. Banking that energy is so vital. As we see, the second Ice Punch was ready, and he denies it with the Frenzy Plant here. Excellent way to secure this matchup by Keen Bart. So clean, so clean. Mwah. And able to, going to be able to get to another Frenzy Plant to take this Charm Tails down. It may be a case where the other moveset may have actually been beneficial for a tangent. Maybe the Powder Snow Weather Ball combo would have been able to get some spam going, able to take the Nine Tails down. So maybe they just needed to switch movesets with that Nine Tails from the last set uh, with Burner Bus. <laughs> may have worked out in all of their favors. Uh, but uh, just really, really unfortunate at the end there. Uh, Venus were playing it really nice there, keeping his energy, getting the energy exactly where it needed to. I was a little bit skeptical when they didn't throw the sludge bomb on the nine towers. I was like, but, but, it's, but it's, right, it's right there. There's no more shields You're ready to throw, but still able to just throw these bulk frenzies to do a whole lot of damage. And so huge on that uh, Metachan, able to deny that last ice punch as well. That was definitely really unfortunate for Tangent there, unfortunately. Yeah, Tangent trying to claw his way back into that matchup. We saw a couple of different scenarios where maybe a little bit shaky on the decision making. I don't know how I felt about the Lapras staying in the lead there, especially after the bit of desync that we noticed. An extra confusion snuck through. I mean, Glade was a bully in this set, and we saw it just bully that Lapras in the lead. I mean, even though your only choice is to swap in your hard counter nine tails, maybe you have to. Maybe you have to bring it in there, maybe throw some charms, force the Glade out, throw an Ice Weather Ball against that Venusaur, disrupt the shield stripping power that this Glade has against your team, just so you can maybe live to fight in the second half of the match. But we saw there Lapras unable to really make headway against Glade, goes down shields, and uh, finally takes it down, but is in a prime condition to be farmed by the Venusaur, and then Energy Advantage Venusaur, almost unstoppable in the end. Yeah, obviously, hindsight is twenty twenty, and these battlers knew what they were planning to do at the time. Some things worked out, some things didn't. And I think I think you're right. I think that that matchup, maybe swapping out that Lapras, keeping it around for later on, that Nine Towers being able to do a bit more damage, threatening with that Ice Weather Ball, I think that definitely could have gone a lot better for Tangent. Uh, but unfortunately for him, he's just going to have to take that retrospective knowledge from Game 2 and apply it into Game 3 to try and shorten this lead that Chicago is now starting to run away with, 7-4. to four. Again, uh, because it is a 7 versus 7, there are 21 battles, so you only need to get to 11 battles to essentially win the set. Uh, you get to 11, you win, so Chicago only needs 4 more points to get there, whereas uh, Canada needs a full 7, which is definitely a, a big play to see. But we'll jump into Game 3 here, see if Tangent can do it. If anyone can do it, he sure can. And we are going to see the Ice v. Ice in the lead. Going to see Keenbart's move set, and it is going to be that charm. Hoping for that meta champ, but unfortunately it was not. We're actually not even seeing meta champ on Tangent's side at all in this set. Uh, but uh, how does this matchup kind of go, Speedy? Yeah, I think the charm, as you can tell, is really, really chunking down this Lapras. It's throwing those resisted ice shards. Charm is neutral, going the other direction. Here comes the big Skull Bash, and it's shielded up. Even with the buff, though, look at these charms just eating away. And also, see, we don't see Glade here on uh, Keenbart's side either. That's very true. Lots of interesting uh, team decisions being made here. And actually going for the Psy Shock to take this Lapras down. I'm not sure what the what the plan was there, because I uh, wanted to be sure, right? <laughs> yeah, really making sure that this thing goes right into the dirt. But we are now going to see this Nine Towers go up against this Stun Fisk. This Ice Weather Ball is not, not big nuke moves by any means, but it's still going to add up a little bit of damage so that this uh, Stun Fisk can come in and have a little bit of advantage going into this matchup now up against Tangent's Energy Advantage. But still a, a bit of an interesting swap. I would say so. I mean, this is a position where you're down shields, you're down energy, and you swap into the mirror matchup. But then again, the longer you leave the nine tails in there, the more energy that Stunfisk would farm regardless. So I don't hate the play. Going for a really high oh. finesse bait. This rock slide bait is disgusting to grab the shield from Tangent. Such a nice little trying to claw back any way they can. And I think I think we actually saw that they were both going for rock slides there, but uh, Tangents would be taking out. Wow. You just... 
That, I love the call. He he says Tangent says fool me once. No, you go <laughs> ahead, fool me twice. No chance. Here comes the rock slide to finally get rid of the stun fist here. We did see the CMP tie again. Keen Bart stun fist prevailing with CMP, but it maybe succeeded in its mission, Steve. It actually uh, evened out the shield scenario. Yeah, you're exactly right. Nine tails, no way it's coming in. We're seeing the Venusaur come in and the instant swap into Gallade, which means we're going to see this charm versus Gallade action. Look how much damage is flying. The Gallade has the has the charge moves ready to go, but they were just they decided to stay in, eat all of this damage. That was, that was really scary to watch. I, I, I felt like we were going to watch another energy loss situation, but I don't think Gallade is going to be able to get to another charge move up against this Venusaur because they just lost too much health. No, look at Keenbart pushing and pulling the pieces around here to try to get a favorable matchup there. Going to push for the double frenzies here. Looks like a move from the Stunfist is coming through its rock slide. Do you shield just be safe? And he does. Fair call, fair call. Wants to make sure this all goes well. And still just one. I think another uh, another bind is all I need for that second frenzy plan. And this is, this is, this is, this is. Uh, <laughs> this is locked down here, it looks like. Uh, look, there's, there's a lag condition. Maybe uh, maybe he's going to go grab a sandwich or something. Maybe he's just going to forget that he needs to keep tapping to in the matchup. Thinks that doesn't have to hit the bubbles to get the charge move through. But uh, yeah, that Sunfisk is going to be going down. And uh, Keenbart, able to just push this lead further and further. We're now seeing 8-4 for Chicago. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to say... Sometimes when you're in a matchup like this, you see that Gallade come out in the lead twice. Maybe you're preparing for it. Maybe it's on your mind. And just like, uh, again, with another boxing analogy, if you're really anticipating that fighter's right hook and then they just sneak in a couple of left jabs and it really throws you off balance, that, that I think that's what we saw happen here as well. Uh, that Gallade is just such a, a beast, such a threat to the team. And I think the adjustments maybe weren't quite there for Tangent. A little bit of a questionable play there to stop in that Sunfist <laughs> so late but it definitely succeeded in getting that shield back, evening things out. High level play by Keen Bart. Uh, again, like you said uh, on the onset of this match, Steve, these trainers are in diamond tier for a reason. They are seriously, seriously talented and just all around excellent plays on both sides, no matter what the score says. You are exa exactly right. Like it's, it's incredible either way you cut it. These two are really strong, and I'm sure they're going to continue to be really strong fighting through the rest of diamond tier after this week. This is only week one. Like, there's still like six more battles they have to do against another six of the top teams in North America. So the, the fire hasn't stopped, but we are going to be jumping into set numero five now with uh, going into the open Great League uh, with uh, Bulk 88 up against Chumpaletta. And we are, now that we're getting a little bit more condent, oh, I hit the wrong thingy. Uh, yeah, now that we're getting a little bit, a uh, little bit more wide open, we are going to see some more variety of picks, some more variety of typings flying around, and uh, we we are in the great league right now. Like, look look at the first Pokemon of both of their teams. Like, it, it's it, it's Azu. It was always going to be around. It's here. We're seeing the blue bunny, right? <laughs> and both fourteen ninety nine. Just 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 fun facts. Fun facts only uh, on this stream. Uh, but we are going to see Valk88 with the Azumarill, Glaring Sunfisk, Metacham, Tropius, Alolan Ninetales, and Alolan Mark. Again, movesets all up for debate. There are so many movesets. Holy heck. Azumarill could have any moves. Metacham could have any moves. Tropius could have any moves. Alolan Ninetales could have any moves. Alolan Mark could have any moves. Galarian Sunfisk is pretty much the only thing that you know what is presumably going to be throwing at you. This is a scary uh, spot for some letter. Obviously, Muddy Water, right, Steve? Yeah, uh, and Metal Claw. Uh, Metal Claw, Muddy Claw. Water. And, uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but no... I couldn't agree more with you. And th there are these subtle clues, right, about this, that's, uh, excuse me, the CPs of these Pokemon. The 1499 Azumarill is the signature CP of the level 50 Azumarill. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that is right, which means, uh, I mean, these two are really strong battlers. I think they are two that may be going out of their way to get those good IVs, get that XL candy and power it all the way up, ready for these. Like, these are the open Great League battlers. They have chosen to pursue this one of these seven roles. And it's for a reason. They are ready to go. Uh, but uh, Chumpalata actually running with a pretty similar team there with Azumarill, Metacham, Galarian, Sunfisk, and Alolan Muck, all the same, only running a Bomber Snow and Jellicent differently. A Bomber Snow presumably, presumably running that Powder Snow set to make it similar to a potential Alolan Ninetales. Although, you know, there is the chance of Razor Leaf, just as Tropius has that chance as well. So maybe it's going to be more like a Tropius than an Alolan Ninetales. And that Jellicent there who has not seen a lot of great battles so far. In Well, it's seen a lot of great battles, but uh, it hasn't been the biggest contributor to the to their success so far in his stream. Uh, but do, does Jellicent have a bit more of a hope here? Does it? 
Yeah, I absolutely think it does, Steve. If we look here at things like the Azumarill, a Pokemon like Medicham as well, and then even the Alola Ninetales, especially if it's packing the Powder Snow fast move, I think Jellicent has a ton of play. It's one of those new Pokemon that we asked for for months. <laughs> we really wanted it to be added to the game. You know, when is Frillish coming? When is Frillish coming? And it finally arrived, and it's a really useful core breaker. Although, as we pointed out in the dungeon battles earlier, it can be counterintuitive in how you use it as well. The Ghost and Water Typing it's very reminiscent of fire ghost with the lola marowak it's kind of counterintuitive how that pokemon actually works so i would like to see some unique usages out of it here uh two things i wanted to mention steve when we look here at the top team for bulk he has galarian stunfisk and tropius this is a very solid core we see in go battle league constantly the grass and stunfisk core is op sometimes we see venusaur in that slot as well but what he's lacking here is that traditional uh sableye or pellip or safe switch which we actually usually see on the GBL team. So sometimes trainers like to pack in their GBL teams into these open great league teams of six because they're familiar with them. They run them a lot. They practice against tons of different teams and they're comfortable with it. And if we look down at the Chumpaletta team, he does have the Obama Snow and Azumarill. This really reminds me of a team created by Lyndon Ryu, that Shadow, Obama Snow, Azumarill, Sableye team, but we're missing that third component as well. So a little bit of go battle league spice here but not quite what you'd expect but i have to say steve i know we've spent some time on the teams here but that alolan muck pick on both sides i'm really really surprised by that alolan muck doesn't usually enter the great league conversation these days no i think it's one of those picks like these are both elite battlers they've been hanging around a seal for a lot of a long time and i think alolan muck is just one of those picks that is always so good in silver arena metas that you just kind of get a little bit more comfortable with it and you like the spice you like the ability to kind of use whatever move sets you like i think they're just silk battlers through and through and they've brought it in there maybe using it as that safe swap instead of the sable light or the like uh does does operate quite well in that role able to just use snarl to get its charge moves off so fast dark pulse sludge wave can be uh fairly dynamic in the in the uh, matchups that it does end itself up in there is a little bit of fear uh with azum rules potentially uh with our uh, stun fisks potentially running around on both sides that could get them in a little yes. bit of grief uh but and you know i, I was going to say oh of, of course we're going to see galarian stun fisk because it's, it's great league but of course we're going to see any of these six pokemon uh they're, they're all going to be running around wild there is only one way to find out what they're actually going to use maybe we're going to be exposing some go battle league lines here by jumping in straight into number five Bada bing, bada boom, let's get going, Speedy. Let's do it. Tropius into a lowland muck. Oh man. Muck definitely has the edge here. We do see the poison jab moveset coming through as well. Swapping it to the mirror, and both of these mucks are just jabbing each other here, Steve. <laughs> Getting a little bit empty, actually ditching now, and oh man, it is that stun fisk. This is a rough spot for that muck. I, I know it got that energy advantage. It has a little bit more to throw, but Dark Force just doesn't do that much compared to how much like one single earthquake can do to just wipe this thing off the floor. Like, um, I, I think this. Oh, actually, Bulk has Acid Spray on their mark. This is a. Yeah, this has ahead. become a very interesting matchup now. But uh, no, they're just gonna gonna let Muck go down, save Acid Spray for another uh. day, and uh, we'll see what Tropius can do with S. Oh no, it is Razor Leaf. Oh, that is a map. Razor Leaf. <sighs> Yeah, the fast move pressure really showing here. Uh, that Muck matchup is so crazy, especially with Poison Jab. It's hard to keep pace with the Stun Fist, but here comes the Rock Slide. Dealing super effective to that uh, Tropius there. The Razor Leafs are adding up, but not quickly enough, Steve. Here comes another Rock Slide. Uh, Bulk, just really tough start there, and it doesn't seem like he's been able to uh, claw his way back into the matchup quite a, quite yet. No, if this Tropius takes out this Stunfix, they're still going to be at Alolan Muck with Poison Jab in the back. And if you look at Champaletta's back line, they've got the Jellicent Alolan Muck. And uh, not being able to line that Tropius up onto the Jellicent is really just really rough. Like this, this Tropius is going to be going down whether they swap or not. And then it is going to be the Galarian Stunfisk up against Jellicent, which is could be anyone's game. Let's take a look at the movesets. And it looks like we are going for that Bubble bubble Bear moveset, which is definitely nice to see. But the, uh, And there are actually still both shields on both sides, which uh, means that these Bubble Beams are going to be potentially getting some shields eventually which is it's always rough to have to shield a bubble beam it's always so rough it's like ah fine here you go whatever right i i think uh, the shield here of the earthquake is really high level uh Shielding this early against the Stun Fist, especially after it's, it's been debuffed, is tough. But you want to really lock down this matchup. I like the closing, 
<laughs> Sorry, saw the message there. Uh, Christine wants to know, but anyways, the uh, the closing uh, kind of um, um, mindset that Chumpaletta has here is really powerful. Throwing the shadow ball too, Steve. Oh, wow. He's not even playing around with the bubble beams. I really love the aggressiveness by Chumpaletta uh, trying to close the door here on Bulk. Yeah, and Bulk actually not shielding it, which is really rough, and going to let this Earthquake come through. Knows that they can tank it after it's been debuffed already. I mean, it was already a pretty nice thing to tank, and actually deciding to throw the bubble beam onto the Tropius. Uh, so this is definitely going to bring it right down. And then I'm assuming we're just going to see a mad tap swap into a Lolan Mark. Here we go. And Tropius is going to be going down here, I think, before it can get to a charge move. Down it goes. And here comes that Stun Fisk hanging out in the back. Has to burn his energy if it wants to do anything here. But uh, yeah, it, it's just not going to be able to. I wouldn't be surprised if Bulk doesn't shield here. Yeah, they're, they're letting it go. It, it's GG's. And Chumpleta actually taking it out to start to claw back uh, for Canada. Bring it up to the 8-5. Yeah, Chumpaletta, fierce, fierce closing power there. I love the Shadow Ball. I love the aggressiveness. I love shielding the Earthquake early. If you're going to continue to debuff the Stun Fist, you might as well shield the heavier Earthquake, which happens earlier in that matchup. And I really love the awareness there. Very, very difficult there for Tropius to come back. We did see the Stun Fist and the Alola Muck on both sides of the battle there, Steve. But just the alignment was was all in Chumpaletta's favor. And again, we got some valuable intelligence. We saw Bubble Jellicent. We saw Razor Leaf Tropius. And we saw the the full move set of that jealousy that it is a bubble beam and a uh, and a shadow ball, no ice beams running around, which is always always really valuable knowledge. Which pretend like it was such an interesting thing, like throwing the shadow ball at the time that they didn't shield, they shielded up the bubble beam. It all just went in Chumpleta's favor. Everything worked out. They shielded first, and it was the earthquake. You know, knowing that Bulk was going to be going for that big nuke move first up it was just just really well played on all fronts. Understanding what was likely to happen and just predicting it correctly. And that is how you get to this stage of the competition for sure. And now it's just up to Trumpler to just keep the train moving, keep this momentum going, and keep closing that gap between Chicago and Canada. Let's jump right into game two. And we've got the Alolan Muck up against the Abomber Snow, which is not a good lead for that Abomber Snow. We don't know what moveset it's running yet. It just decided to run away with it. We're actually just going to see the Metasham come in with the Power Punch Psychic, which is a very interesting moveset. And here we go. We're going for the Acid Spray. Do we see a shield? It's not quite a sludge wave. Oh, and he shields it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it, it makes that like boom sound whenever this lands. It's so funny. Uh, here we see the psychic coming through on the meta champ. Even though the defense is lower, the attack is still at full strength. Do we see a shield here? Bulk says, no, you can hit me with it. That meta champ does absorb it like a boss. Let's see. Oh, we're actually, we have Ooh. mirror movesets on the meta champs here, Steve. Wow. And it, just aesthetically pleasing. They're both mirrored outwards as well. Both power punches on the center. Uh, is putting the psychics on the outside. We get really nice that they've done that for us. But we are going to see a shield on the psychic going the other way, which means Chumpaletta is now down two shields. Bulk, two shields up and going for the power punch to try and get these two shields out. But he, Bulk is going to fall for it. Look, that, they stole one shield with the acid spray. It's only fair that Chumpleta gets to steal a shield back with the power punch. And look at this one counter ahead, able to get to that psychic. Two turns earlier, going to throw this. This is going to be more than enough. Oh, you can't sink two shields into two pups, uh, Steve. And I think that he just kind of surrendered it there. But look at this, the poison jab dealing neutral. It's going to snipe Ooh. this meta champ before that uh, pup comes through. Really clean timing then. <laughs> Abomber Snow going to come in. It is that powder snow one. Uh, as we're seeing here, and another acid spray coming through. No big sludge waves again, but it's just disrespect at this point. It's like, <laughs> get our spray Doink. full. Uh, but we are going to see that that uh, Jellison is hanging out in the back as well. But we're seeing the catch onto the Galarian Stunfisk. This weather ball is not going to do much damage at all to all the Fisky. Uh, does, does a little bit, a little, a little bit. Bring it down a little bit. But where are we kind of seeing this matchup go now? That Jellison is hanging out. But again, Jellison, we've, we've seen it lose Stunfisk matchups before. We have, I think you want this Stun Fist to dump some energy on the Obama Snow. Come in with the Jellicent. You need to exit the Jellicent Stun Fist matchup with energy to hit back against the Muck. Here we see the Rock Slide finally coming through. Uh, the Shadow Obama Snow famously can win even shields against the uh, Stun Fist, but this is a regular Obama Snow, and the Rock Slide is still enough. Here comes the Jellicent. The Bubbles are going to do some work, but I don't know, Steve. It's very uphill if that Muck, uh, some kind of combination of Dark Pulse and Earthquake is probably enough here. Yeah, it was kind of interesting seeing that they decided to just let all this energy come through. They're not throwing the energy yet. Oh, actually, no, they did throw. Throwing after the earthquake is kind of interesting. That I think that must have been a CMP tie. That is really rough. That's so unfortunate. Yeah. And actually didn't quite take it out, but they didn't heal all the bubbles there. And now they are not at a charge move. This mark is going to be able to get to this dark box first. A little bit of mutual lag there. And actually, 
not not sure what happened there, but I think the correct thing happened. I think it all worked out. Yeah, correct. Uh, these dark holes. I, I think. Yeah. Despite the skip, I think the the outcome was the same as it would have been otherwise. Down goes the jelly, and Balk bounces back uh, to take game two there, pushing it up to. Look at that score down there. It's 9-5. Chicago he's only needs two more battles. This is a... Two? This is... <laughs> oh, as a spray. Such an awesome move. Uh, but only needs... I mean, Canada needs to really just step it up here. Champoletto able to take that first one, knows what they have to do. Got hit by an acid spray to a shield that game. So like, okay, we know that that's around now. We don't have to be scared of a sludge wave. Maybe we can play it a little, dip, little bit differently. Hold our shields a little bit closer to our chest and be able to take it out this time around. Uh, play it out a little bit clean. Again, it is. I think it's really interesting in this matchup in particular, just how many, how much the move sets really matter, and how much they could have both played a bit of mind games with each other and choose. Because again, getting to choose your moves after the teams have been revealed is usually a nice advantage. You're able to come in with, with the right moves, but if with these teams of six, there are no right moves. It is all I don't know what they're going to run. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to go for uh, Razor Leaf Tropius. Let's go, and we'll see how it all works out. Which is always an interesting time. I I think for bulk unfortunately or for i think was it the first game that bulk wasn't able to kind of get their lineup in the right spot their tropius just yeah. couldn't find that uh jellicent they couldn't get things in the mm. right spot game two went a lot smoother for them still a very very dynamic all the way through but was able to come out in the end a lot clean and it's just a matter of game three whether they've kind of picked up an in enough info they know what's going on now they're both able to both players are able to make more informed decisions based on the move sets that have appeared and it all comes down to this, I suppose, going to the, the game three. Let's take a look. Oh, man. Huge lead for Bulk here. The Metacham into the stun fist. We see the instant switch out. In comes the Metacham mirror. Uh, Steve, this feels like the Spider-Man meme where the two Spider-Men are pointing <laughs> at each other and they're just identical. Uh, yeah. And I mean, not, not entirely identical. They're just flipped. The, the, the power at punch and psychic uh, positions is, makes them very different Pokemon in this matchup. And, you know, uh, but we are <laughs> going to see the swap into Tropius, which unfortunately with no ice punch, this definitely makes it a little bit better for Tropius than it would be otherwise. Still going for that big psychic, which is still going to do a fair amount of damage. It uh, looks like we are a little bit ahead on the Champoletta side as opposed to the bulk side, uh, just in, the, in terms of the videos, uh, but going to get be able to get to another psychic. This Tropius losing health pretty fast. So even though there's no ice punches, which would do like double super effective and come at quicker the psychics are adding up and forcing that shield out of bulk uh and now it's up to medicham to decide whether they want to shield up this uh oh if lag well has it dun dun we're we're catching up here hello hello <laughs> hello game oh we're gonna go for the aerial ace I, honestly steve i think the leaf blade probably would have been enough at this juncture but you see the fighter you want to get that flying type attack out it is super effective down goes the metacham in comes the stun fisk as well you're going to try to get to another leaf blade let's see if throwing the aerial ace maybe hurts him a bit here but no dmp actually perhaps oh my gosh and this is pretty rough as well, because again, we're seeing Chumpleta with that Jellicent in the back. So Tropius, again, not able to land on it. We've just got the Metacham and the Stun Fisk. Looks like our Chumpleta is mad tapping on that Jellicent. They are ready to swap. They may be preparing for that Metacham to come right back in, and Jellicent is ready to go. Uh, Bulk was tapping on the Stun Fisk, but a little bit slow there, unfortunately. Only like one fast move, so not the biggest thing in the world. And we are now back into the Stun Fisk v Jellicent matchup that is apparently anyone's game and usually not Jellicent. Uh, we are actually going to see the Shadow Ball Grump straight away and land, which is a really nice land for the Jellicent. It's just going to be whether shields can be used. Uh, I mean, again, it's, it's one of those cases where the Bubble Beams are going to be reducing the damage over time. So generally, you are going to wanting to be burning those shields a bit earlier on, and we're seeing exactly that take place. But Bulk not taking chances and does go for the Earthquake instead of the Rock Slide Bait, because that could have been a big risk, some reward in that regard. L Look at this crispy timing on the bubble beam here, Steve. Able to fire this off one mud shot before that second earthquake comes through. Very, very nice play That's there. I mean, I'm just such a fan. Still able to get it. I, I thought that it was about to go down there, but still able to hang on. You know, I've still got an earthquake in me. Yeah. And uh, look, it, it's not a great spot, uh, but we are going to see the Metacham come back in. Does have a shield. And uh, Met oh, Jellicent actually going for the bubble beam before they had the energy for the Shadow Ball. So... If Bulk was counting, which it seems like they were, not going to shield. 
Excellent catch. We saw that aggressiveness come through on Chumpaletta, throwing the Shadow Balls early, but that time just opting for the Bubble Beams. I mean, maybe he's just trying to apply some pressure here, maybe draw a shield, maybe put that question in Balk's mind. Does he have the energy? But Balk is not taking the bait. No <laughs> shielding, two Bubble Beams, but that Metacham is also pinned, Steve. It can't swap out and clear these uh, debuffs. Yeah, exactly right. And it's going to be down to Stunfisk trying to take out a double debuffed meta champ in the back it does have a lot of health and power punch isn't a big big hit like a dynamic punch would be so it's just going to be about whether it can ramp up these counters fast enough uh to be able to outpace the stun fisk's potential earthquake coming through which uh yeah meta champ really kind of pushed down the hill by stun fist there in terms of attack he's trying to climb back up here comes a rock slide bait and this is actually huge steve oh my gosh. rock slide bait is is massive uh, situationally here what a play. Really nicely done there. Again, just incredible stuff. But coming out of both battles here, uh, but another power punch going to come through. Sunfisk is so close to that next earthquake. It is just ready to go. Counter, oh. counter, counter. It's going it, it, to get there. It's going to get there. It's all good. All good. Earthquake going to go through. And Canada, Champaletta not going down without a fight. Able to get this 2-1 through. Trying its their best to bring Canada back. And it is now going to be 9-6. Oh man, this is yeah. <sighs> what a what a sweaty set there for both of those trainers. <laughs> very 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 tough battles. Uh, getting pushed downhill. The 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 Jellicent really did its job there against the Metacham. Unable to rise back up and take out the Stunfisk. Stunfisk is one of the best Pokemon in Great League for a reason. It's because it can hit back against all of its counters. No matchup is certain when you're a stun fisk against whatever else it might be it can be really really uh, tough sledding no matter what pokemon you have but i just want to compliment again the grit uh for chumpaletta there to come back and 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 try to claw his way back into the set for his team very nice plays and bulk again uh kind of on his heels at times but still was able to walk away with the two victories and you know extra 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 props to chumpaletta because i think they have also given a bit more credit to jellicent uh, this time around <laughs> able to do a lot more positive things maybe a little bit too harsh earlier on but uh seeing as we are going to be going into there's, there's only two there's only six battles left and they're going to be ultra league and master league there is potential for the jealousy to appear but uh if it's not an ultra i don't think it's gonna be in master and there's only one way to find out if it's an ultra and that is by again button oh there's no jealousy man <laughs> darn uh, but we are no. instead going to be seeing beach again beach seven oh beach seven Re really liking these names just just throwing that out there um but we've got <laughs> venusaur machamp alolan mark lapras garyos escavalier and then jamie on the other side running that uh venusaur alolan nine tails again move sets polyrath shadow move sets alolan mark move sets cresselia move sets skarmory no, not as much move set it probably it's probably running sky attack brave bird but you never know you never know it's been a while since I've seen a flash cannon on a Skarmory. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> true, true. Sylph Season 1, perhaps, right? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Uh, but Speedy, the, we're starting to get into my murkier waters. Ultra and Master, not my not my battleground. I like to stay in the sort of more Great League, the uh, dungeon, the nightfall sort of area. So take me through what you're kind of seeing in these two teams from these two very, very strong battles. Yeah, absolutely. So I just wanted to begin with saying that in the Ultra and Master League uh, specialist uh, arenas here, if you will, you can bring one Legendary or Mythical on your team and Beach just left their Legendary at home uh, for this set. <laughs> I, I don't see any Cresselia, Giratina, anything of the sort here, Melmetal even, nothing like that. So uh, Beach versus the uh, Jamie here or Jameis, if, if, I, if I may. Uh, bringing that Cresselia down there in the bottom. So the very first thing I look for is that Legendary. Sometimes when you have a Pokemon that is so powerful, it can really define the identity for your team. If you see a Bastidon on a team of six, it really sets the mood for what you're going to see. Not seeing a Legendary on Beach's side is interesting, but seeing that Cresselia does give him some intelligence as well. Also, Chad, I wanted to mention, uh, as Steve kind of parlayed into this match, we were expecting to see more Jellicent. We've seen so many XLs in GBL Ultra League. I don't see hardly any XLs here at all with the maybe exception possibly of the Lapras. It doesn't need to be XL in Ultra League, but it can be if it's a 0 15, 15 to, you know, to the like, the L-shaped IV pattern as I call it. But if you look down here at Jamie's uh, team, he does have the nine tails with XL potential as well as the Skarmory, which is obviously an XL itself. So very interesting to me. And this almost has like a retro Ultra League throwback vibe because we also see Shadow Polyrath down there for Jamie, <laughs> which is a Pokemon that was really good 
in the initial outings of Ultra League and GBL, but we haven't seen it that much in factions. So whereas one team is usually heavily XL, maybe the other one isn't, neither of these teams are packing that extra 10 levels of stat product. So it's going to be very interesting to see how these matchups unfold. Uh, speaking to the regular matchups themselves, we both see Venusaur in common. We see the Alolan Mux in common. We see double counter users from Beach 7. And I really feel like uh, the Alolan Muck has a lot more play in Ultra. I've been loving it. It's one of those anti-XL core breakers that's still extremely powerful and uh the gyarados is where we want to look if we want to look for a move set roulette as i call it you <laughs> might see dragon breath waterfall even though the legacy dragon tail is a potential here for the gyarados aqua tail is almost always a, a sure thing but we can also pack outrage we can pack hydro pump uh, as well so I mean, really, yeah, we don't know where this is going to go, Steve, but you know, this, these teams are very, very interesting and a fantastic way to start Ultra League because this isn't, XL, this isn't the XL show. Uh, this is actually a very balanced uh, approach, and I'm enjoying it so far. Yeah, very true. I, th I think the potential that you mentioned, the thing that is a bit of a throwback to the more limited Ultra League, and this could sort it. I guess it kind of is a limited Ultra League because you're only allowed to bring one legendary or mythical, even... You can bring zero, I suppose, evidently. Uh, you can only bring one starter Pokemon as well. So it kind of makes that pseudo, uh, pseudo restricted Ultra League meta that maybe brings out these more picks like the Polyraths that can potentially do a little bit better. And it definitely does have some play up against Beach 7's team. Uh, so we just kind of have to wait and see. I'm, I'm not loving it. I don't know that it's going to appear uh, in these sets of three. I feel like there are some other Pokemon that could potentially do a little bit better. It does have some play, again, depending on the move set. Move sets are all all over the shop here. Uh, we just have to wait and see that. Let's jump into the Ultra League and take a look going into battle number one. Absolutely. We see the Cresselia into that uh, Venusaur confusion. Obviously worse for the uh, Venusaur, but it actually is Psycho Cut and he's not. Well, actually, he is packing the Future Sight there, Steve. Ooh, this makes things a little bit scary for that Venusaur. It's not a common move set to be running, but clearly Jamie's has gone, yeah, this is, this is what is best up against Beach's team. So we'll see if they potentially let this come through. Over farming on the Cresselia and Venusaur not running away, potentially scared that there was going to be a swap out, but going to be able to get this uh, get this through. And Venusaur not deciding to shield. That is really rough. That Venusaur is almost gone. And at this point, would be able to psycho cut all the way down. Uh, not even burning the shield, not paying their respect, just going, hey, I got this, man. Cresselia is such a bulky Pokemon in the Ultra League. Just a few more and down that thing goes with a ton of energy ready to fly into whatever comes in. Absolutely. We do see the double counter users there coming in for Beach. He comes in with the Escavalier, guaranteed to resist these moves a bit better than Machamp would. I wanted to mention as well, chat uh, reminded me that you can only bring one starter Pokemon as well on your team of six in Ultra League. So you can't pack Empoleon and Venusaur. We do see the Venusaur on both sides here. Here comes the Grass Knot. Very good counting by Beach to recognize this is not another future site. Uh, the Cresselia is going to chip as much as it can. But again, Escavalier is going to hang tight. And with a ton of energy ready to go, which is really nice in that closing spot where there are still both shields on both sides here. Skarm are going to be coming in. Oh, man. This is so unfortunate for a Scavalier. All of the energy that it just built up. Just, ah. Oh. Wow. Yeah, this is tough sledding for the, for the drill run. Even though that Skarmory is a steel type, it is also a flyer. So it's going to uh, not take too much pain from the drill runs. And it knows that here. Like you said, though, Steve, still four shields in play. I would not be surprised to see a Machamp swap in here to try to overpower this Skarmory. Uh, this is tough sledding. But look at this Skarmory just not throwing at all. And Whoa. it's suddenly very low. We blinked and the Skarmory is, is going to dip into the red here. Yeah, I guess counted as a really good move. And... I mean, Jamie's just holding tight, staying calm, going, I know I got this. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> the snipe, the high skill snipe by Beach. Excellent, excellent play. In comes the Polyrath. Machamp is rolling now with two counter energy advantage. I love that play. Oh, my God. You, you mentioned it. You mentioned the potential for the swap head to Machamp. I didn't realize it would be so dramatic and so much energy just burnt up. Jamie's brought it right down to the wire, tried to stay cool, and could not get the energy off in the end. And now we are stuck with this Machamp up against the Shadow Polyrath. We're going to see the shield start to be burned now. It is going down. Uh, there's the shield on the cross chop. Presumably only going to see cross chops from this uh, shiny Machamp. Really nice to see there. And Polyrath is just sitting there going, what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Polyrath not dealing nearly as much damage with Mudshot as that Champ is doing with the uh, counters there. Also, Champ is just rolling with these cross chops. A third one comes through here, Steve. And this is going to really put Polyrath on its heels. 
There is actually that Hydro Pump that is waiting the wings, but unfortunately not going to get there this time around. Hydro Pump just going to have to wait for another day. Beach, this actually puts the score at 10-6. This well, has let been... me point this... Oh, go ahead, Steve. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying this puts us at a case where uh, where I need to move the text around, but also where, <laughs> also where uh, Chicago now only needs to win a single battle to take it all out. Well, I, I wanted to point this out as well. If you look at this matchup on paper, we saw a Cresselia and a Skarmory versus a Venusaur Machamp Escavalier, right? And on paper, that looks desolate. Like, there's no way uh, to, to really kind of pencil your way out of that matchup. It can be very difficult. But we saw Beach work just some magic there with the Snipe. As you guys know, the Air Slash is a three-turn move, counters a two-turn move. For damage to apply, it applies one turn faster than the move actually completes so even though counters a two-turn move it gets that damage registered on turn number one so he's able to land two counters in the span of one air slash so by the time that skarmory reset its move it was already ko'd excellent excellent play there recognizing the win con and the skarmory maybe playing with its food a little bit too much against <laughs> his cavalier yeah, I mean, that, that is the case. If they threw the sky tech a little bit earlier, if they decided to burn the shield, they would have been able to hold on. They would have been able to take those counters from a champ. They would have just been able to unload the energy. But unfortunately, just a little bit too greedy. And you would have thought that it would have been all been okay, but it's so unfortunate. And just losing so much energy. Must have had 4,000 energy on that Skarmory. All just gone, not able to throw and take those shields off the Machamp so that maybe maybe Polarath in the back could have landed that Hydro Pump onto that uh, Machamp. Could have gone a whole lot differently, but unfortunately, just not the case this time around. And Jamie's, I don't think he's going to be making the same moves again. Uh, I have a feeling that if they find themselves in a spot where they're trying to farm down in the Scavalier, they might throw a little bit earlier. Uh, they might decide to, it's worth throwing some energy at this thing. Uh, potentially. I think so too. But we'll jump into we'll the game see. too, see how we do. Again, <laughs> Chicago only needs to win one more battle. There are five battles left, and Canada needs to win them all. They need to win the rest of Ultra League. They need to win the rest of Master League for this full comeback. Chicago cannot... Well, they, they can lose four times if they want, but we're jumping in with that Alolan mark up against the Skarmory, which is... Is that is that Poison Jab? Poison Jab on the mark. That is not going to do much to Skarmory, unfortunately, but is it running that Acid Spray as well? Acid Spray, really popular move for Chicago, apparently. The question only becomes, is are they going to be able to get another one of Canada's shields on these famous, uh, famous Chicago Acid Sprays? One way to find out. The Brave Bird is there, ready to go on the Skarmory. Don't, 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 don't farm too much, Jamie's. I, I'm too scarred. I'm too scarred. Don't throw. Thank you. <laughs> we, we don't want to see that again. Going straight for the Sky Attack here. As you mentioned, Steve, those Poison Jabs really not adding up. Skarmory is very favorable here. And we do see the double counter users again in the back. And look at this. Jamie is really course correcting here. <laughs> double Sky Attack coming through. Trying to get that Skarm, I think, into counter down position is the main goal here. And squeezes off the Dark Pulse, which is actually really big for Beach here. Yeah, that is huge. Not not as cool an acid spray, but still bringing that Skarmory right down to the red. No, Skarmory almost energy dry here. Anything that comes in is going to be able to farm this thing all the way down, I think. All right, going to see the swap out into that Cresselia, which is really nice for that Machamp. And going to swap into a Scavalier, this is not a great spot for Beach, but the fact that they've got that Mega Horn is going to be able to do a fair amount of damage if they can get one through, but it's going to take a lot of damage in the interim to get there. Yeah, in the four shield scenario, you do have a resisted fast move damage on both sides, it would appear, but it looks like the, uh, or at least neutral for the psycho cuts, but it looks like here you want to land the mega horn, but you have to work through these shields too. We do see a really nice shield there by Beach, uh, protecting against the future site, going for the drill run and oh. a great call by Jamie, no shielding drill run. Wow, that just puts Beach in such a worse spot here. Like, really wanted to get those shields out and just wasn't able to do it. We're actually going to see the future site come through here, landing on this Gavily, going, okay, you didn't shield my last one. I'm not going to shield yours. How does that feel? Turns out it doesn't feel that great for Beach. That is a lot of damage on that Gavily. Now going straight for the Mega Horn, and we're not seeing the shield. It's going to land. It's not going to take it out. Oh, wait, it is going to take. Mega Horn's huge. Yeah. Yocha. Mega Horn's. <laughs> Megahorn's huge. Two shields still in play, and that uh, Cresselia drops. Going to squeeze off another drill run here. This doesn't do a lot of damage, Steve, but as we saw in game one, we saw so much fast food pressure from a champ. It can be really dangerous here if Polyrath gets too weak, and he shields. I really love the shield there, to be honest. 
Yeah, it's kind of interesting what uh, what the strategy is going to be from this point out, because I think ideally uh, Jamie's is going to want to land a Hydro Pump onto that Machamp in the back, deciding to go for the Dynamic Punch, and there's no shields coming up on Beach's side. They're going to let that go down so the Machamp can come in to try and land these bulk cross drops already up to one, and we're actually now seeing another Dynamic Punch coming through. Jamie's, I guess, recognizing that they still have to get this shield, and Beach deciding to burn it. So really nice for Jamie's there. And they've got that Skarmory ready to catch a move. Not catching this one, unfortunately, but still going to burn the shield. The question becomes, are they going to be able to successfully catch the move onto Skarmory? I think you identified the win con right there. Got to count these counters. Oh, and he sneaks in the cross chop. Polyrath can't escape. Skarmory is just waiting there, and it never got called in. Coach, put me in the game. Coach never made the call. Well, Coach is putting it in now, and... Uh... It wasn't a good call, coach. Why? Why? <laughs> why Steve, uh, you just have to feel the frustration there for Jamie's. He's running a Skarmory and a Cresselia versus a double counter team, and he's just unable to capitalize. It must be so frustrating there. But you can't, You also can't say enough about how well Beach played those, those uh, situations. His situational awareness with that Machamp is just phenomenal. I, I truly feel like that first game, bringing that Machamp in and taking out the Skarmory is easily the play of the stream. Like that was just absolutely beautiful. And it was such a tide turner, such a destruction of all of this stuff that Jamie had built with such a good line, so much energy ready to go, just wiped away out of the game. And with this game, Chicago has now officially won the won the bout up against the Canadian Shield on. Really nicely played. 11 to 6 is a really hefty score there, but there are still another 1, 2, 3, 4 battles left to play. One in the Ultra League, three in the Master League. So Chicago, this is a game where in factions, it's not entirely a case of you just want the win. It's not just those two ones. Every battle actually matters for your overall sort of leaderboard score to get up to the top. You want to get as many wins as you can so that you can outrank them. I believe in the last cycle in North America, there were multiple teams that did have 5-0, able to win five bouts out of five but marylanders uh, were the ones who had the most battle wins so they were put at the top able to take out the win and so it is really important in this diamond tier you want to be at the top and actually it is also extra important this time around because there are now relegations you can be moved down and up tiers and if you perform not well enough in the diamond tier you can get moved downward so chicago and canada both of them have a big stake in wanting to get as many battle wins as possible so they can try and avoid relegation later on down to the platinum tier but let's see how we go jumping into the third game bada bing bada boom take it away my friend speed uh, I mean, right off the bat, this is very favorable. We see the swap out here into the Polyrath. Trying the Polyrath safe swap, which I think is actually pretty constructive here, especially when you've seen the double counter user so often. We know this is a drill run. No reason to shield, right? Right? Let's see what Polyrath does. And he Ooh. does shield. He wants to protect the health, which makes sense, yeah. right? Because you also want some energy uh, on the Polyrath so you can hit back. Really Ooh. interesting choice. Going for the Hydro. Yeah. Scavalier are going to get pumped here. Oh my gosh, are we going to see the pump? <laughs> the Scavalier gets washed away. Really nice play there. I know I know, Dynamic Punch was potentially like, you know, it would have done a ton of damage, but it's really nice to see a Hydro Pump. You know, Jamie's may even just be going for the, this is cool, right? This is this is cool. Uh, we are going to see the Dynamic Punch get a shield out of this Machamp, which, uh, you know, really nice to see that the big moves go through, the littler moves are getting the shields. And now Machamp could potentially... Is he going to go for the cross oh. No, going for the full farm down. It yeah, has to but look at this. Oh. He he had to there, but he's going to get this move off. This means that you have to two-shield the Machamp and commit. You have so much energy. We've seen Machamp be so useful in this set. You can't allow yourself to let it go. But the Skarmory comes in. You're out of shields. You have, what, 12 more turns until the Sky Attack comes through. What is your plan here as Beach? This is actually really scary because, like, Cross drop doesn't do a ton. He's going to go for the rock side and try and get this through. And they've got a Lola Muck in the back. And we saw how that matchup went earlier. And that poison jab just did not do very much damage at all. It's able to land the rock side, which is nice and all, but this Skarmory is still in the yellow. And we are seeing that full health Lola Muck in the back with Machamp's health just draining. Uh, Skarmory is actually getting fairly low. Again, this is a case where the counters are really adding up. Yeah, they're really sneaking up on you just how far this health can go down. But uh, Skarmory... Getting a little bit too comfortable here. I'm, I'm, I'm still scarred. I'm sorry, Jamie. So I'm, <laughs> scarred by the Skarmory. I really like the Sky Attack here. I think, Steve, to be honest, I think you need to bring in your own muck. 
maybe come out, come out of this matchup with some energy, maybe bank a sky attack, and he does just that. Throw the acid spray right away. When you don't have a uh, neutral type attack, when you only have dark pulse, I think that the acid spray setup is very important here in the mirror match. And because there are no more shields, unfortunately, you know, he's just going to have to have to do with the damage and the debuff alone. And it's also a case where there are no more battles left over. So, uh, you know, there's nothing to hide left. But going for another Acid Ray, which is a bit of an interesting call, because this, along the mark, is still very healthy. Uh, you know you know what it means, Steve? This means that he's going to come in with Machamp and eat this thing up and then CMP the Skarmory. I think that's the win con. Oh, he's wow. He's going to try. Going to try. We, we've seen Machamp do crazy things before. Can Beach do it again? Going to get that Dark Pulse through. Not quite taking it out. And we're going to see a third Acid Spray going through, trying to make this thing go down as low as it possibly can go so Machamp can really come in and clean up. What? Into the red. And here we go. Can he do it? Oh, oh that is nice. Here we go. Winning CMP there, Machamp. Wow. I'm blown away. <laughs> But champ hard countering Skarmory <laughs> two games in a row. <laughs> oh my gosh. Beach. Be I mean, look, Beach is like, again, one of the top ranked players, not only in America, but in the entire world. And there is clearly a reason they know they're doing that from the Machamp. And it is now 12 to 6 to Chicago. Just, oh my gosh. That was a poor yeah. Skarmory that <laughs> just cannot catch a break. It's so, it, positioned it, so well up against their team, but just wasn't able to get the oomph through, unfortunately. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And as we look more at the team here, some of the choices make sense. Look at his Cavaliers play against the Venusaur, the Ninetales, the Alolan Muck, even the Cresselia with Megahorn, even the Skarmory only taking neutral from Sky Attack. Uh, the Scavalier makes so much sense here uh, to bring from Beach. And then that Machamp, once it got energy rolling, you recognize there's no true hard counter unless you've got like a, I guess, a charm nine tails. But even if Machamp gets rock slide energy, it can be really, really threatening. Just masterful play there by Beach. Uh, and it's also a, a clinic in a way as well. Trainers that say that you need XLs to win an ultra, maybe that's not always the case. Uh, you just have to absorb some of Beach's insane talent and you can do it, right? Yeah, and uh, you also don't need a legendary. Even if you're allowed to bring a legendary, you do not need one to win. And uh, a dominating win as well. That was a 3-0 from Beach, which I don't think uh, I don't think it communicates well enough how close those battles were. Jamie's was in so many strong positions over those battles, but just Beach able to outplay them at every turn and able to get that 3-0 out in the end. And that does bring us to there's only one set of three left, and that is going into Master League, another area that can get very scary with you know, all sorts of XL level 50s going on everywhere, except it's not just like, you know, there's some XL Pokemon. It is all bring as many XL Pokemon as you can or else you may start falling behind. And I'm straight away seeing that there are some similarities and some big differences between these teams. So do you want to kind of take us through what we're seeing here between Shapocalypse and Frag and Wagon? Yeah, Master League probably gets the the least love out of the different leagues uh, that are available in rotations in GBL in Silph Arena, which is which is just historically a great league centered uh, organization. We see Master League coming in here to factions as well. So your friends, your trainers that really grind legendaries have that chance to shine here with these immensely powerful Pokemon that they have built up over the months and years. And I think that's just another insanely awesome facet of the Silph factions. What I sincerely believe to be the future team-based pvp so we do see the master league battlers square off here a couple of interesting tidbits we do see the legendaries first though we see that mewtwo coming in from uh s chop chopacalypse Sh -sh apocalypse i'll just Sh -sh i'll just say apocalypse right sure well it's, it's in the name so it's allowed that <laughs> it's in the name it's in the name. we see apocalypse is mewtwo and then we we kind of trace our eyes down to frag and wagon with the melmetal one of mewtwo's best uh, personality traits, if you will, is that it doesn't get hard walled by hardly anything. With Psy Strike, with Shadow Ball, with Focus Blast, with Ice Beam, Mewtwo can hit back against even its hardest counters. It's such a powerful, versatile, masterly Pokemon. It did just return to raids. And we are seeing right here, Steve, a level 51 best buddy Mewtwo at 4780. That is unreal power just super saiyan 3 power right and then we look down here at the melmetal uh, as well melmetal a fantastic pokemon it's probably the best steel type available 
a lot of trainers in Master League do use their legendary slash mythical designation for the Mel Metal. It's more accessible due to the mystery boxes. If you have the Hundo, which I don't still have, so I'm still looking for that, uh, it can be very, very useful. As well, interesting, the Metagross are actually across from each other, both of them Hundos, but one of them is a Shadow Hundo, Steve, <laughs> which is just, I'm so jealous just seeing that. <laughs> Think of the yeah, Stardust. Yeah. Think of the Stardust. Oh, it's, it's, so it's 360 XL candy for that Shadow level 50, which is just so nuts. We do see the Gyarados on both sides. Snorlax, an excellent neutral play. And then Sylveon. That Sylveon is actually not a hundo either. Its CP is just slightly off. Uh, so that probably is like a 98% Sylveon, so to speak. But I was actually talking with, with a friend a few days ago about Sylveon and the different charmers available in Master League. The one that we always look to is Togekiss. A lot of times with Togekiss in actual GBL battles, we see a lot of very powerful ground-type Pokemon. Uh, Groudon, Garchomp, Landorus, Excadrill with, with its drill run. If you're Sylveon, you're actually going to take stab from all of those moves, whereas the Togekiss actively resists it being a flying type. So whereas Togekiss generally wins more matchups because it's safer in the air, Sylveon, a more accessible charmer here. I think that's what we're seeing from Apocalypse because it did just have its community day as well. Although Sylveon, not quite as sturdy as the Togekiss and doesn't pack as many resistances, you actually don't have to worry about that as much because you only get the one legendary uh, in this format as well. So we don't see a Groudon and Garchomp team very often, but it can be very interesting to see how these, these shake out. And then Dragonite as well, very versatile. Excadrill, an extremely po a difficult Pokemon to counter. Five Mud Shots, Steve. It's slightly slower than Politoed, but you get Drill Run, you get Rock Slide. It is lightning fast and it really smashes things like Dialga and the other steals. I'm not seeing anything on Fragon Wagon's team that loves seeing that Excadrill uh, if it's got like energy ready to throw. Everything has to little, be a little bit scared of the charge move. So you're definitely right. I think it's, there's so many, like, okay. Again, I'm not a big Ultra League or Master League expert. You are obviously much more expertise in this area, but I'm just kind of looking at these Pokemon. Those numbers are so big. I didn't know CPs <laughs> went that high. 4,780? Like, are you serious? That's, that's almost 5,000. I've, I'm still playing Master League Classic. I'm 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 noob to here. This is, this, this is just insane to me. And I mean, again, I feel like Master League is the one that kind of exemplifies it the most. Is that league where people can come in from their own expertise, their own strengths, their own uh, things they love to do. The grinders do have a place. And with all of that in mind, let's jump in and take a look at the final set of the evening. Jumping in to kind of round seven, uh, going into game one. And actually, this is a game where we're actually going to be looking at the right hand side uh because shape apocalypse did send their footage through but it kind of it, it just broke it didn't work out uh so we are going to be taking a look at fragon wagon jumping into round one with melmetal versus metagross with that best buddy ribbon but it doesn't mean that they are best buddies so we're going to see this swap into that uh into the swamp it really nice spot up against metagross but going to bring these snorlax out which is a pretty interesting matchup how does this go in master league yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting play overall to make the swap into the Swamper. And as we look at the team there, it is a Melmetal double water squad as well. Maybe anticipating the steals, maybe anticipating the Excadrill at some juncture. Uh, this is interesting, though, because generally Swamper will outpace just as it does in Great League and Ultra League. Uh, the Snorlax normally packing the Body Slam superpower. It's a thicker Pokemon. I think generally I would give the edge here to Swamper, depending on shielding situations. Uh, like you said, Steve, these Pokemon are insanely thick. You're about to see how much a body slam does to a Swamper in Master League. It's, it's a tickle. Think. It's <laughs> it is truly a tickle. These there's gonna be okay. How do Master League battles not time out? If we're gonna see these hydro cannons and body slams just going all over the shop with such bulky Pokemon can take so many hits. Uh, but we are going to see another Hydro Cannon coming through Quick Smart. There is still uh, two shields on the other side. So it's a question of are we eventually going to be seeing it so they can keep their Snorlax around, keep throwing these Body Slams, the Body Slam spams coming, going to let it come through. And it's now at a point where it is going to be able to get another Body Slam off, but it is going to be able to get Mud Shot down after the fact, I believe. Uh, so it's a question of whether they want to burn both shields in this lead matchup. And I feel like you just don't necessarily want to. And down it does go. Yeah, so he successfully lured out the Snorlax. I'm not sure if that's what he was fishing for, but Apocalypse probably going to come in here with the Melmetal, continue to gather energy. The calculation he made was, does the Snorlax get to a superpower? And I don't believe it does. Oh Getting a big, juicy Thunder Shock down. Heart racing. Uh, <laughs> huge energy ready to go. Melmetal, such a powerful Pokemon up against pretty much anything it has. And here comes that Metagross again. 
We're back into the lead. It's a little bit of a rough spot because these superpowers are not going to do tons of damage because of the psychic subtyping on that Metagross. It's a question of whether Fragon Wagon is going to be swapping out into that Gyarados. I feel like they have to be swapping at some point. Uh, another superpower going through now. And we don't know what moveset that Gyarados is running yet. It could be, it could be Bite for all we know. Uh, it could be Bite, Gary, right? And it's going to resist those moves. Throwing Waterfalls. I love that moveset on Gyarados and Master League Factions. Very, very versatile Mon. The Waterfalls give you some additional water pressure without needing to bring a legendary like Kyogre. We do see the Charmer come out in the back. Or no, excuse me, Mewtwo. Sorry, the icon was kind of cut off. Uh, but you see the Mewtwo there coming in. And with Shield Advantage, this is going to be very tough for uh, Gyarados to overcome. Yeah, the, the pain of uh, different phone sizes, making it clear, evident uh, that things can be confusing when you put it in a box. But uh, this is, seems like a pretty good spot for the Mewtwo to be. The Psycho Cut's just farming up energy so far. Psy Strike, look at the power of that move going through no shield. And there's now Mel Metal in the back who does not have an awesome, like it's not a brilliant time up against Mewtwo. It's not a brilliant time up against Metagross either. It's just not in a great little spot here. This uh, We're presumably going to see another move come through. We don't know what the other move on that Mewtwo is yet. Focus Blast, a very popular move to be running around with all of these steals coming around. Do we see that now is the question. Ooh. Oh, Flamethrower. Um, who had Flamethrower on their bingo card in chat? Right? <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, at this at this juncture, Steve, I feel like this this is more of a information gathering mission for Frag and Wagon. Just kind of overpowered here. Mewtwo is going to go down, but here come the the Metagross, and it's going to bullet punch down the uh, Mel Metal. No reason to throw a charge when you still a shield apiece on both sides. Chicago Chicago pushing further further into lead with now it is a thirteen to six. They are potentially putting themselves up for a 15-6, which is a dominating score. We saw earlier, things were moving so evenly. You know, we were even 2-2, two -two, even 3-3, three -three, even 4-4. Four -four. It was all moving. And then Canada seemed to freeze. And Chicago just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. And they are really pushing now. Shea Apocalypse pushing for that 15-6. We'll jump into game numero tuno and we are seeing that garchomp up against mewtwo which is not a great start for the garchomp can potentially uh depends on the moveset there what are we is that sand tomb and outrage as the moveset and we're seeing dragon tail as well which is so many move options on that garchomp but we are seeing this go through uh actually not putting a shield on the psy strike that is a ton of damage coming yikes yeah the that's probably the one drawback of Mewtwo, though, uh, Steve, is the lack of fast move pressure. We see, like, Psycho Cut, Cresselia, and Ultra League has a very hard time farming down a Pokemon. Mewtwo also has a similar issue. Making the switch, though, into Snorlax, this is interesting. Coming in with Gyarados to answer, uh, I'm not sure what the trainers are fishing for here, but maybe the, the Metagross onto the Mewtwo at some eventuality? We'll see. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of seeing, like, if Fragonwagon has that Metagross hanging out in the back as well, it's kind of pretty decent in the back we've got a melmetal and a garchomp on fairly low health so garchomp is likely to, going to be able to get a charge move off onto it if it exists of course all hypothetical but uh, it's not it's not in a great spot for for frag wagon here so we'll see how they do end up playing it out getting a ton of energy just off onto this snorlax no shields being burned such a just thick bulky pokemon that can just take hits from all sides and no shields there. So it is your fourth fifth and sixth shield uh for for master league but uh gyarados exactly. Oh, I was just going to mention, Steve, uh, this is interesting. We've seen the Snorlax safe swap twice in a row. Snorlax being probably the only, outside of maybe slacking, uh, normal type that you want to run at this level. And with no counter user on Frag and Wagon's team, it just makes sense as a perfect safe switch. And we're seeing him really exploit the lack of counter user. No Conkledor, no Machamp, no uh, even Haxorus. So the Snorlax has been very powerful. But the Gyarados finally gets the better of it here in this matchup. Yeah, it does have to contend with a shield advantage on the other side, though. It is that two to one. So whatever comes in, even getting this charge move off, they will be able to shield it. And he's actually that Mewtwo. So charging up to the crunch and throwing the Aquatail, which is an interesting play here. I'm not sure if that was just panicking that they weren't going to get there, if they're intending to get another charge move off later on in the matchup. Does get the shield out. So actually maybe, oh, maybe pushing to try and get another Aquatail through, but it wasn't going to happen there. Yeah, I think maybe slightly misjudging the pressure that the Psycho Cuts applied there. Coming back in with the Garchomp, he wants him to dump energy. Going to look for a bullet punch down, I would assume, and then try to close strong with the Metagross. No need to shield, right? Yeah, come on. Yeah. Down it goes. Here we come, and let's find out what Shapocalypse is hanging out with in the back. 
we do know that it has the flame peril, so it has to be a little bit scared of this matchup still, whether they want to burn the shield or not. And they do correctly oh. shield the flame through a really nice call there. Really nice call. Oh. And we are indeed you remember, seeing... Yeah. You remember Master League Premier Cup, Steve, when you go down a shield against Metagross, it's so <laughs> difficult in the mirror. The earthquake really hurts. Uh, it can be really devastating in this matchup. Yeah, we, we're seeing every every try and play in the book. Throwing the medium mash does get the shield out there, but unfortunately that other Metagross has the energy advantage. He's going to be able to get to these earthquakes faster. Plus that Mewtwo is hanging out in the back. Not that it's going to be able to do too much. I think this is probably my first uh, first Mars League experience losing these mirror matches up against Metagross. I think Zionic just earthquaked me away. Uh, able to always get that energy advantage. It can put you in such a rough spot. With uh, Chapong is now able to push it to a 14 to 6. This is just getting incredible at this point over double the wins and uh <laughs> able to just i yeah. guess that uh the the mewtwo moveset really has done them some dividends here i know focus bus is a really nice thing to be able to land on those steel types but for flamethrower similarly able to land a big hit and even potentially a better hit onto metagross i'm not sure how the numbers quite work out there but uh because of the psychic typing making focus bus a little bit worse of a hit maybe flamethrower is a better way to go there yeah, I can actually tell you I'm going to go to the, the friendly neighborhood uh, PV Poke here and take a quick look. Almighty PV like Poke, the, thank you for all that you do. The greatest member like, of the entire community. We would be nowhere if we're not for PV Poke. Uh, but what? Oh, are, are, are I, the, I have the, to the numbers in, Chris? No, I have to say, Steve, I think that the flamethrower is definitely superior. It's got a 2.21 DPE. It does 70.9% damage, whereas the Focus Blast is a 1.69. Pretty nice. But it only does a 73.8%, a higher energy cost move. Flamethrower really optimized here for this matchup. Apocalypse uh, in full control of this, uh, this set. He knows what moves he wants, and uh, it's really paying off for him in a big way. Yeah, absolutely. And with that, I think that brings us to the final battle of the stream. Going in, Chicago pushing for that 15-6. Canada trying to push so they so they won an even third of the battles. Uh, but let's jump in and be icing that Swampet versus Gary in the lead. Have we seen Gary on the other side yet? No, this is a Dragon Breath Gyarados as well. I mean, this is definitely favorable for the Gyarados. And we see the Sludge Wave on behalf of Frag and Wagon. I mean, the Charmers and the Gyarados are probably the only two matchups you want this for. And at least he gets this juncture that he's able to fire the uh, Sludge Wave. Yeah, exactly right. Does do a nice little bit of damage there. Almost getting down to half health and then bringing the Mirror Gyarados with the Waterfall, which is another sort of interesting swap in there. Uh, this is definitely looking pretty decent for the opposing Gyarados, even though they are down a fair amount of health. They're going to be able to put a lot of pressure back onto Frag and Wagon's Gyarados. You see, they're basically even health now almost, uh, landing that crunch through. And another charge move is coming through. Um, no, this is yeah. not a great spot for Fragon at all. I think you've got resisted waterfalls really showing the inferiority compared to that <laughs> non-stab Dragon Breath. Uh, here we see another Aqua Tail coming through from, from Frag and Wagon. He's hoping to grab a shield here, perhaps. And he doesn't get one. It doesn't take the bait. And Dragon Breath is just going to eat up this Gyarados. I can't believe how quick you were to just throw Waterfall under the bus. You said it was such a nice move earlier on. And now you're just getting rid of it, throwing it aside now that it's not convenient. <laughs> uh, we are seeing that Melmetal come in, farm down the Gyarados. And here is that Metagross again. Not where Melmetal loves to be. Are we going to see the same play where they go for the double superpower? Oh, we're actually going to see the Rock Slide come at first this time. Trying to get a shield. Uh, but it's not a matchup where they need to shield. So really big plays here. No shield. Yeah, great call. When you have that much health on your Metagross, there's really no reason to shield that early. We do see it maybe backfiring here for Frag and Wagon. Does he decide to shield? Oh, it's a Meteor Mash. My gosh, the baits are just so <laughs> deadly here. That's just the, the, the dynamic of the power differential, right? Because Earthquake is almost going to one-shot, if not clean one-shot the Melmetal. Superpower, Metagross can survive. So recognizing the leverage in those situations is really key. Swampert pushing for the cannon. I like this attempt by Frag and Wagon to try to get back into this battle. Yeah, really trying to maneuver it around so they can land that thing and actually letting the Metagross go down. Going to see the Mewtwo come back in the back. This is looking pretty good for Shapocalypse here. Does have the shield advantage on... Uh, yeah, it has the 2-1 shield advantage. Is that right? And we're actually going to yes. see Frag and Wagon let this come through. Yowchi. Down goes the Swampert. And here comes Melmetal. Has to save the day. 1-2 to two shields. We know that Mewtwo has the Flamethrower. I think at this point, they can pretty much just go straight Flamethrower. And are going to be able to take this matchup out no matter how Melmetal cuts it. Uh, as we see here, Melmetal uh, also going to lose CMP. Ooh. 
Yeah, Mewtwo has insane attack as well. It's almost guaranteed to, to win CMP in most Master League matchups, which is really useful, especially when you have a two-turn move. You can kind of line those up where you need them. No, Again, no need to shield the, the Rock Slide there. Melmetal really working uphill. And as we saw, the Scythe Strike, not quite a flamethrower there, Steve, but still took a decent chunk out of the Melmetal. Yeah, really nice call on Fragons in to not shield uh, the Scythe Strike as opposed to the, uh, the Flamethrower, but I don't think that it is going to be enough to tip the tides in saying that the health is almost even now. It's just that Melmetal needs to get this last shield and then also do enough damage to take out uh, Mewtwo in the, the time that it can get two off. I, I feel like it's not necessarily as set in stone as it looked earlier, but uh, Mewtwo is still kind of loving where it's sitting. <laughs> Oh my god. Oh, gosh. no shielding again. I really love the call, but look at the mail metal. It's just limping along and it gets psycho cut down the paper cuts, right? We're able to uh, <laughs> to bring down the mail metal at the end of that long exhausting battle. Which puts us at the final score of the evening. It is 15-6 to Chicago. Wow. Just we saw seven battlers on both sides facing it out. Such such incredible talent on both sides. Such incredible plays. We saw Machamp as the ultimate Skarmor encounter. We saw Jellicent starting off really hard in a cocoon, just getting bashed, and then eventually becoming a butterfly, going to the Great League. Um, but in the end, Chicago able to really just really steer ahead with a 15-6. to six. That is really dominating. Like, yeah. I have to mention, I've seen Burnabas in the chat. Burnabas was our teammate in the Squirtle squad for the Sylph uh, Factions Invitational. A lovely gentleman. I've also spoke with him uh, prior to the Go Team Up finale as well. Uh, Burnabas, excellent battler, excellent uh, lead for this team as well. Just really shows that that he works hard with all of his teammates to try to make sure that he draws the best out of all of his his uh, his uh, his teammates there, and he does a great job of it. As we saw there, Chicago Stars consistently one of the best. I really feel like the Shieldons challenged as much as they could in certain scenarios, but there's so much room to grow. I feel like these are very talented battlers. The latent talent is there, more experience, more reps, maybe a little more team building exercises, and they are knocking on the door of being right up there with the Chicago Stars. The score is lopsided, right? Over double the points for Chicago Stars. They were really in control of this entire faction's bout, but I think that the uh, the Shieldons are here for a reason. They're in Diamond Tier for a reason, and if they uh, recollect themselves, learn from the past mistakes, they can be right back in the fight in the coming weeks. Yeah, I, I've i had the pleasure of being completely stomped by uh, Canadian Shieldons team, uh, team captain, the tang Tangent 444, uh, multiple times now, and I know that they have some serious skill. We've seen it on display here today, and they can definitely bring it back in the next six, six bouts, uh, of this cycle uh, to try and claw back to the top, maybe say hello to Chicago Stars again, uh, who are hurtling towards the top. I don't think I mentioned at the start, but the Chicago Stars are quite potentially the most stacked team in all the factions with three legends, four elites on their seven roster lineup here, and then Emzal, uh, who is in the chat as well, hanging out in the alternate slot. Uh, and also shout out to Canadian Shieldons, uh, uh, alternate, who is that Jimmer Banks chair chair hanging out there. Alternates yes, also yeah. very, very important uh, to the team. They're all there for the practice. I know uh, in my team, the alternates are always getting in there. I think Mirko Asylum is our alternate for this week. And that, you know, Mirko is always around, ready to do some battling, practicing with everyone. Uh, it's all, it's a team effort. You know, you've got that team of eight. Alternate doesn't mean they're not involved. They're just as much involved as anyone. And we're, they really put out their best stuff today. Chicago Stars, able to play with a huge, just huge score. It not, I feel like the 15-6 isn't as indicative of how well the, the Shieldons did play as well. Uh, but Chicago, able to put it down on paper and doing really well. Uh, but with that, that brings us to the end of FSPN tonight. Speedy, do you want to say anything before we head off? before we run away into the wilderness, uh, never to be seen again. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, technically until next time, right? You know, we'll run off and we'll, uh, you know, do, you know, spend some time in the wilderness, but we will make our way back to Sylph Factions, I hope, because I really, really enjoyed this format. I just wanted to, to give a big thank you to you, Steve, uh, for inviting me to come on. I always enjoy these formats. Uh, just really incredible. I sincerely believe this is the future of team-based PvP. If you're not here watching the Sylph Factions, you are missing out and just 
a lot of the time when we look at Pokemon Go PvP, it can be very solitary. You're in Go Battle League, you're in a self tournament, you're watching your rank, your wins and losses. But when you're in a team competition like this, you don't always need the best ranked trainers. You don't always need the most experienced battlers. What you need is, is good leadership and then good teammates who can unlock the best potential that you personally have as a battler. And as we saw here, things are really close in the condensed metas. Even Great League was close. I think Chicago really ran away with this with their Ultra and Master League specialists. Locking in those 3-0s was really critical to the scores. And we see just sometimes these, these specialties are overlooked. But if you have a great team, great teammates, you can unlock that potential and that can help you to succeed in factions. I also wanted to thank uh, Silphorina for having me on as well. I always appreciate working with Silphorina. They have a special place in my heart and I really am grateful every single time we get an opportunity to work together. So um, that's it for me, Steve. If you have any parting words before we run off into the wilderness, like you said, <laughs> let's hear it. No, I th thank you for coming on, Speedy. It was definitely a, a fun two hour 16 here uh, we started a little bit a little bit late but we got there in the end and i think we had a lot of fun along the way uh so i believe the uh not sure if i can say yet but uh fspn will be back in a few weeks time i believe in two weeks time there will be fspn back and we will be looking somewhere elsewhere outside of north america obviously we have the we have north america we have apac we've got latin america and we've got uh, eu as well so we will be heading heading elsewhere in the world exploring to find the best battlers in in the best battlers in the world who may eventually uh, find themselves duking it out in some later format later on in the faction cycle. I'm, I'm sure that uh, Sylph has got their, got their brains going. They've got some plans uh, to put the best of the best up against each other in the future. But with that said, thank you to everyone who has been hanging out to the stream. Thank you to Speedy for coming on, especially for that just Master League, Ultra League matchup knowledge that I know nothing about. Uh, huge, huge <laughs> benefit to the stream by having you around in that regard. But seriously, thanks for coming on. Always a pleasure to hang out. Always a pleasure to be here on the on the Silphorina channel, hanging out with all of you folk. And um, yeah, I don't actually have raiding powers. So uh, if someone from Sylph wants to, wants to do the old raid thing, they can. But otherwise, this is going to be the end of the night here. So thanks, everyone. Huge shout out to both teams, the Chicago Stars and the Canadian Shield on. Looking forward to see what they come out in the future. Stay tuned to the Sylph, uh, the articles being put out on Sylph.gg. If you go to Sylph.gg, over on the left-hand side, down a little bit, there are all of the articles being put out there. MJ Get It and uh, Matt Brewer are putting out some great articles over there for their uh, for their respective regions definitely stay tuned to all of that and we'll see you in the in the next one bye everyone <laughs> bye everyone